Hello everyone, and welcome to This Nintendo Life, episode 263! My name is NBZ, and despite the high energy that I show to you today, I'm running on about four hours of sleep, <laughs> because I've just returned from Mexico, LA, the whole... I've been globetropping, Valley. I've been all over the You've world. been to the west um, coast of the US twice in one year. Uh -huh, and I'd never been before in my entire life, and now, now I've been life. to the worst city in the world, LA, two times in one year. The worst city can believe it. in the world. It, it is the shittiest city in the world. I, it didn't I grow on you second time round. No, it's even okay. worse. We were staying in this weird fucking apartment <laughs> that was themed after Twin Peaks. You walk in, there's a giant deer head on the wall, and you go inside, there's a pool table. It's just this fucking weird-ass <laughs> apartment with knickknacks and trinkets and just, like, dusty and just smelled old and weird. Um, anyway, uh, I was at the Game Awards, Bally, so I've been lying to everybody uh, for, for years and years. Uh, no, not for years, but just for a little bit here as we talked about Game Awards stuff beforehand. Um, yeah, I went to the Game Awards because we announced the Rise of the Golden Idol, the follow-up to the case of the Golden For Idol. For those that might uh, be in doubt, mm -hmm. this isn't the big secret. No, it's not. No. It's not that that big secret. Because some people think, aha, this was the, the secret. Yeah. There's a tenuous connection to the big secret here, <laughs> and there was there was some related stuff to the big secret of being on this trip, but um, the big secret is still to be revealed in 2033. Exactly. Fuck we do that. Countdown uh, so. starts now. Yeah, but that was so. I did it. I did a sequence of tweets like a while ago that was like, there's some di days when like doing this job is surreal, and I quote tweeted, I'm like, it's like just got ten times more surreal, <laughs> just got twenty times more, surreal. just got a thousand <laughs> times more surreal. Uh, this, I think, this one was the first tweet. So me going yeah. to the, or us, us getting this on the Game Awards was the first tweet of being like, I think we might get a thing on the Game Awards. That was my first like, this is surreal, and then just stacking more surreal. Which you did. Do you want to plug the game announcement? I, oh, I already did, but I think did. you weren't listening. I already said it. But yes, the, the Rise of the Golden Idol, follow-up to the Case of the Golden Idol, a award-winning detective game, 98% positive on Steam. You can check it out for yourself. It's a very, very good game, if I say so myself. It's, you can't trust my word. Is it coming next it, year? But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's 2024, is what we've said. Um, so, yeah, uh, check it out. Uh, wishlist us on Steam. Um, it's coming out on everywhere. It's also coming to Netflix. So if you've got a Netflix subscription, uh, it's going to be playable on mobile devices and stuff like that. So, yeah, fun stuff. Very, very exciting. Um, and you can hear me chat more about that in our bonus bits, Bally, uh, which is should be out the day yeah. after this episode You, you goes do a deep dive on some of the things that you saw mm -hmm. and Jeff Keighley and details around scratching your bum and stuff uh -huh, like yeah. that. Like it's, it's <laughs> yes. good stuff in there. Yeah, so uh, yeah, if you want to check out uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash this Nintendo Life, you can uh, check that out. Um, but Bally, uh, I haven't even introduced you yet. Hello, how are you doing, Bally? How's it going? Hello, yes. I have been, while well, you've been away in LA doing all sorts, I've been beavering away at The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and I have beaten that game. I played 100 hours and I'm not going to say what I think about that game. Okay. Because... <laughs> we are going to be talking about our game we are going to be talking about it yes uh so this is our episode uh the last one of the year uh, and it is slightly delayed uh because i did just get back uh a little bit later um so we are delaying it because of that reason obviously gave Dal bally time to finish zelda all that good stuff gave me those extra few days to get to the end. Uh, -huh. uh gave me some time to play uh, more hours of octopath traveler 2 uh which continues to never end but is good so we'll talk about that um and uh and yeah that's that's what uh what's going on but Bally, you want to tell the fine folks at home what today's show will look like for the first segment we're going to be talking about the listener games of the year so everyone sent in their lists we will go through those and then for the second segment we're going to be discussing our game of the year we will be making a top 10 combined list of the top 10 nintendo games that came out in the year 2023 uh, and then after that everyone very kindly sent in your personal top fives into like the form that mbz put out into the world mbz mm -hmm. has been doing some maths this afternoon and has tabulated an official listener top five games of 2023 yeah we might uh, do the top 10 as well just because there's Let's enough there 10, that we yeah. can do it um uh yeah so it's it's gonna be a fun one it's gonna be good um so bali uh let's kick things off with some listener games of the year that people have been sending in we're gonna be catching up a little bit on some goatee tea to coatee some people yeah. have kind of merged quite lists a few together here. quite a few uh there's quite a few um so uh, but bali where could they send these lists to if they wanted to be you know for example in the new year when we do our predictions for 2024 mm. uh, and they want to send some of those in where could they send them to please email this nintendo life at gmail.com that's this nintendo life at gmail.com yes we will definitely be getting to predictions next show 
Mm -hmm. Yep, so do send those in. Uh, but let's kick things off. Bally, do you want to take our first uh, sure. Game of the Year email? It's from Wicked Gamer UK. Alan says, these are the games that came out this year, the top five. So, number five, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Number four... Did I say five? Yeah, five. Star Wars mm -hmm. Jedi Survivor. Number four, Metroid Prime Remastered. Number three, Super Mario Wonder. I prefer 2D Mario over 3D Mario because I love the challenge of precision platforming. Super Mario Wonder doesn't get everything right, but it does change up a formula that was getting stale and is an awesome return to form. Nintendo is at its best when it goes all weird on us and there was just enough weirdness in Wonder to make it fun from start to finish. Number two, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Even as I type this, I can't believe this game is number two on my list. What a video game. This is Nintendo at its peak and they don't disappoint. I love this game so much that even the parts of it that aren't great, I overlooked. This has to be the most engaging story in the Zelda franchise. Awesome boss fights, great use of environmental puzzles and endless secrets to find. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has enough different gameplay elements to keep me coming back to spend more time in this version of Hyrule. And then number one, Cocoon. Where did this masterpiece come from? Wow, what a sleeper hit. I love this game from start to finish. The environments and the puzzle, puzzle elements were so cleverly designed with the right amount of challenge. There were many times when I got stuck that I had to put, down, put the game down for a while and when I returned, the solution just jumped out at me. And for me, that's fantastic game design. No hand-holding, but everything is there for you to figure it out. I really hope more people find time to play this game and we get more like this in the future. Oh, and the music and sound were sublime as well. Cocoon for Goatee 2023. Uh, well, thank you, Alan, for falling on the right side of history here. Uh, the correct choice, uh, number one. I, I mean, Cocoon's just, it, it is just astonishingly good. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was absolutely blown away by it. It's, it's that one game this year that just, it. all I wanted to do was play that game. Uh, and that hasn't happened uh, with uh, a lot of games in recent times, uh, and this year especially. But uh, yeah, that one was, uh, it, was a, it was a sticker. It stuck to me, so very, very good. Uh, all right, our next list is from Beeking from Sweden. and says, hey guys, here are my top five games of the year released on the Switch. At number five, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Future Redeemed. Number four, Metro Prime Remastered. Number three, Super Mario Bros. Wonder. Number two, Cocoon, an amazingly well-designed and polished experience with no, uh, with no doubt the best puzzle game and the cleverest game I've ever played without fail striking the balance perfectly where I got the solution just at the moment before wanting to look it up. I've never felt so smart solving some of these immaculately designed puzzles. Number one, Tears of the Kingdom. I find it hard to say with absolute certainty that Tears of the Kingdom is a better game than Cocoon, seeing that they are extremely different in scope and feel. I can't even say at this moment if Tears of the Kingdom is better than its predecessor, saying that I don't feel it had the same impact as me on, as Breath of the Wild did at the time. My personal experience playing Tears of the Kingdom, however, having taken two full weeks off from work to play together with my fiancé, is probably the greatest gaming moment I've had in my life to date. Seeing this world that we once discovered together as our first gaming experience as a couple, and seeing how it had changed over time was just an absolute delight. Just just discovering everything together for the first time, the depth, the different zone devices, the tears and the story all the way to the final boss was an amazing ride. Not to mention the engineering genius that made this game function, let alone run on Switch. Just an astonishing achievement of a game that will hold up a very special place in my heart. Keep up the great uh, job you guys are doing. Look forward to all your goatee content. Greetings from Sweden, Beeking. It's great when people have the mul multiple people have the same great point to make about Cocoon, which is that you know you feel like you want to put the game down or look up a, a solution to a puzzle and then you just discover it and i've heard countless podcasts say this about cocoon and it just speaks to like how strong the puzzle design and the game design is that everyone gets to that point and then solves it mm -hmm. i say 99 percent. there's maybe like one percent that do like get, get stuck for a few hours but yeah yeah absolutely um and uh yeah glad to see xenoblade chronicle 3 future redeemed being sneaking on there at number five i think yeah. it should maybe sneak higher but we'll see <laughs> we'll see uh on some other lists uh, all right Bally, you want to take the next one our next one is from duncan's from wales it says hi guys sad that i miss getting my go tt dakota list to you but here's my top five for the best i've played on switch this year number five vember number four a space for the unbound number three octopath traveler 2 Better than Octopath Traveler 1 in every way. Characters were each clearly defined and the combat as gripping as ever. For me though, it's the soundtrack that is the real highlight here and I keep coming back to it months later. Number 2, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Played upon release, I wasn't sure how I felt about Tears of the Kingdom, but after revisiting it in October, I feel like this is an accom accomplished compromise 
of the open exploration that made Breath of the Wild great with the story and epic adventure that made the old the old style Zelda games my favorite. It's not my favorite Zelda and I still think Breath of the Wild is slightly better as a whole, but still an incredible game. Number one, Legend of Heroes Trails to Azure. Like I needed reminding, but nevertheless, Azure has cemented the Trail series as my favorite JRPG franchise. These games are each like watching the best multiple season TV show you've ever seen or reading through an epic series of, of novels. Amazing turn-based gameplay, a twisting, gripping story, and characters I miss deeply. Although I'm always up for a new console, outlets have been too quick to write off the current Switch. I loved being a Switch owner this year. Still plenty of experiences, either exclusive uh, to or best experienced on Switch hardware, with some golden last breath releases coming next year. Have a great festive break and hope you uh, both get some time to enjoy those game trades before the end of the year. Oh, Thanks, God. Duncan. Don't remind me. I don't. I don't know if I can do it, Val. I don't know. You're gonna do it. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm going down south of England tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, day after tomorrow, and I'm bringing Sonic Mania with me, and it, it's gonna happen. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I'll. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I'll see if I can. I, I'll. Try, I'll try and. It might be fun to live stream Metro Prime. You know, like I did with Mario Sunshine. Like the only way to get me to do it is to force me to do it in front of an audience. So that might be. I the think thing people would be up do. for watching that. <laughs> yeah maybe we'll see uh we'll see um so yeah no duncan showing appreciation for the trail series i think anyone who gets into trails becomes a sycophant for it and it's just like <laughs> this is the greatest thing of all time uh, i am right at the beginning of my trails journey i'm like 12 hours into the first sky game um so i am already very much feeling the vibes what, what, uh, with where, that where's series. this series from when did it start on gosh what, what so it's from? a it's a falcom so falcom who do the ease series ease uh uh, they do a um, bunch of like niche JRPG right. was stuff. Was this like basically. PlayStation One? Uh, the original was PC. Oh, PC. Trails in the Sky has come to PlayStation before with the Trails of Cold Steel games. There's like it's a whole thing. But I, I've watched multiple like four hour videos on like where to get started with the Trail <laughs> series. It's a fucking rabbit hole. <laughs> but the the in basically the music instantly was like this is big xenoblade vibes and like the writing is really good mm. um it looks very old school like it looks like a very old ps1 game and so the visual thing might be a little bit of a hump to get over but it plays so well on steam deck steam deck is the place to play this series i think uh, every game is available on pc so steam deck is a good place to play it and i'm loving it so far i'm very very deep uh, into uh i'm not very deep into it but i'm, I'm very i can see myself falling deep into it um because it's it's really really good so far so yeah um the trail series is one on my list and i'm just at the beginning of that journey so hopefully i will catch up eventually but there are like 16 games and it is it, it, it makes sense for me to get into it right because it's basically like the wheel of time for video games is essentially what it is um uh it's, it's yeah it's massive so anyway uh our next email is from Chris B, who says, Hey guys, the backlog doesn't discriminate when it comes to release year, so I've put everything together in a single list. It's been an absolute banger of a gaming year for me, though. Also, hearing you talk on the latest episode about getting accounts on how long to beat is something I wanted to weigh in on. I've been using it for the past few years now, and getting to see a breakdown of all my stats and data is a real motivating factor for me playing as many games as I do. I'd love to follow you both on there to see what you've been playing. Anyway, my list. Number 10, Eastward. Number 9, RPG Time The Legend of Right. Number 8, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Number 7, Super Mario Odyssey. Number 6, Astral Chain. Number 5, New Pokemon Snap. Number 4, Paper Mario Color Splash. Can I just say in the middle of this list how bold it is to have Super Mario Odyssey at number 7 and Paper Mario Color Splash at number 4. Uh, I'm getting big Simon vibes from this list so far. So uh, Number 3, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Truly the greatest 2D Mario game ever made. There's not a single thing I really dislike about this game, although one minor nitpick is that I would have loved to see them go a little bolder with the world themes rather than sticking to the same generic tropes. All other aspects of gameplay feel like utter perfection and has me really excited for what is to come next for the next 2D Mario series. Number two, Persona 5 Royal. I am so glad that I finally made time to play this game. I had the cartridge sitting on my shelf for so long, but I was really intimidated to actually start playing it due to the length of the game and wondering whether it could ever possibly live up to the hype. I'm glad to say that it easily lived up to my lofty expectations. The music and story are absolutely immaculate. I loved every moment that I got to spend in this world. Battles feel effortlessly stylish and satisfying with as all heck, particularly once you've mastered the baton pass mechanic. Everything just feels so epic, which adds real weight to every moment of gameplay. NBC Said, I implore you, please get Bally to play this game sooner rather than later. But I'm trying here, man. I'm trying. Uh, but you know, there's only so much you can do. Um, 
Uh, number one, Professor Layton versus Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. Everything about the vibe of this game is totally my thing. The mystery, the intense moments, and the perfect blend of two series that seem made for each other. I love the story so much, even though the ending was a little convenient. On the puzzle side of things, they felt like the strongest set of puzzles in any Layton game thus far. I'm not sure if we'll ever see another crossover between these two series, or whether it'll live up to this one, but I'd be there day one if they ever try. Here's to another year of playing awesome games. All the best, Chris. Um, well, yeah, as a massive fan of Layton versus Wright, it's a worthy number one. It's like the list. number one game I want to borrow from you on 3DS. Mm. I think MBZ. Like, yes, that'd be yeah. a good one to to play. Yeah, it's it's a great entry into Layton stuff if you've already played Phoenix Wright and has mm. basically it replaces the worst bit of Phoenix Wright, which is the investigation portion with Layton puzzles, and then you just do the the court scenes from Phoenix Wright. So it's like the best oh, of both great, worlds. Yeah. It's really good. So. Right. Excellent. Our next one is from Justin, who says, Hello, sirs. Here is my 2023 goatee list. Truthfully, these are the only games that released this year that I finished. I'm currently playing Jusson, but I will not complete that in time. Nice, chill experience. Also, honorable mention to Metroid Prime. Didn't finish it. It's still great. So, number six, High on Life. Number five, Super Mar Mario Brothers Wonder. Number four, Super Mario RPG. Number three, Hogwarts Legacy. Number two, Cocoon. Such an intelligently designed game, such a simple uh, concept fleshed out so well. Each, every puzzle is better than the last and it builds upon its own foundation to such a satisfying degree. Annapurna has quietly become one of my favorites. I love the touch of music changing in certain areas uh, when the game knows you're on the right track in, in solving the puzzle, simply by carrying the orbs in the proper direction. A beautiful experience. And then number one, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I have such a strong love-hate relationship with this game. I want to make one thing very clear. Breath of the Wild is a better game. I have a feeling MBZ feels the same way because he hesitated to say this would dethrone Breath of the Wild on your top list. It's okay to admit it. I even went back to the predecessor and confirmed that it is indeed just a magical experience that somehow surpasses the successor. I do not know uh, how that makes sense given the additions and improvements, but I know it to be true. Uh, and then... Justin wrote an awfully long email about very the pros long, yeah. and mainly the cons of Tears of the Kingdom. So I'm not going to get into all of those. Uh, but he also says, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I've not... Uh, I've seen a lot of people talk about Super Mario RPG. I always feel weird about like remakes on uh, end of year lists. But it is one that uh, you know seems like a lot of people have been enjoying a great deal. And shows that that game has been holding up quite a bit mm. um, over yeah. the years. Yeah. So yeah, good to see. Uh, all right our next one is tim from discord and tim says in what was probably the best year ever for video games i didn't play many of my most anticipated new games i've made my peace with the financial decision to wait for most new games to go on sale or get ported to switch or on game pass before i play them but i still wonder what this list might have been with unlimited time and money i'm certain chained echoes octopath 2 jedi survivor hogwarts legacy sea of stars Baldur's gate 3 and wargroove 2 all would have been in goatee consideration if i had played them oh well I'll get to them eventually, and that's why we love and celebrate Goatee T to Coty after all. On to the five games I actually did play and greatly enjoyed. Number five, Little Gator Game. Number four, Venba. Number three, Cocoon. This is, without question, the best design game I played this year. So smart, so smooth, unbelievably creative. Playing this through in one sitting was my most memorable gaming experience of the year. Number two, Fire Emblem Engage. While the story and characters were a step backwards after three houses, in <coughs> Engage brought back the crunchy strategy gameplay and character progression that the series does so well when it's at its best. Even if it ranks middle of the road for the series, I love Fire Emblem so much that it still finds itself high on my list of favourites of 2023. And number one, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I could write essays on how different my experience of playing this game was from Breath of the Wild. At times it was a struggle, yet it still finds its place here at the top of the list because of everything it does right. Managing to expand the Breath of the Wild formula in interesting ways and offer novelty even in a familiar world. The dungeons and narrative are the biggest step up from its predecessor, offering a story that stands out among Nintendo's gameplay first approach. Yeah, I feel like there's a theme emerging here of people being like, I liked Zelda a lot. It was it was good, but it's still, still my number one. It's <laughs> still my number one at the end of the day, you know, um, which yes. is in interesting. And um, I don't know, it kind of speaks to this this type of Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, the style of it. <sighs> at the end of the day, it's just better than pretty much most video games, but there's still those qualms, right? Which is an interesting thing. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, it immediately gets compared to its predecessor mm -hmm. um yeah. rightly so it's always good to compare video games but um ultimately today we're not even doing that we're, com we're no. comparing it versus games this year so yeah totally. maybe it's a bigger discussion for another time but we can certainly touch on it later mm -hmm. 
uh our next email is from perry fan this one's actually from discord perry fan 74 says hey mbz and bally here's my list of games i played that i loved and want people to know about top five goatee dakota no particular order so this was sent a little later uh pac-man world repack immortals phoenix rising a new god dlc bayonetta 3 hell pie Warrior Land Three. So the, 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 those are no no particular that's, order. That's extremely bold to do the, a DLC for Immortal Phoenix Rising. <laughs> yes. That's uh, that's that's cool. That's cool though. And then top five Nintendo games. Uh, again, no particular order. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom, Super Mario RPG. The the later Mario RPG spin-offs are known for their clever, fun writing, and RPG has that too. What I was not expecting was the level of physical comedy this game has. Has some real laugh out loud moments for me. Mario Wonder. Most 3D feeling of the 2D games. First 2D Mario game, I 100%ed. Uh, Pikmin 4, Ochi, good boy. Uh, Blasphemous 2, an amazing search action game with a sense of style and mood that no other pixel game has delivered. The faster paced combat and movement are a natural upgrade to the first game. Can't wait to see more of this series in the future. And then a Nintendo goatee shout out, Lies of P. I can't stop thinking about this game. I loved it. Its art direction and music are stunning. It has combat that is challenging but rewarding. Unlike most Soulsborne games, this game's story is a lot more upfront, and I think this is what grabbed me most about the game. Uh, this game is on Game Pass, so I recommend giving it a shot. Cannot wait for the DLC and sequel. Hope the holidays treat you and your families well. Can't wait to he- can't wait for next year. Prince of Persia: Lost Crown. Let's go. Yeah, let's go indeed. Some previews just dropped for that game, uh, sounding just as good as I hoped. So uh, very awesome. much looking forward to that. And we said, I'm um, surprised this year you never got round to Blasphemous 2. Yeah, I, I've I've been slacking on the Metroidvanias recently. Uh, I really have been. It's, it's been a while since I've played one, and there's just a list of them just like clogging my my backlog right now and i'm like i just i need to just go in there and just tear them apart because yeah it's one of my favorite genres and i just i feel like i didn't play any this year and i'm like that's, wow. that's wild right well, that's very, very strange that'll be good though. exactly that's going to kick off the year it's the year of getting back into metroidvania oh so that's going to kick it off uh i'll probably i the problem is i want to play the original blasphemous first so i want to play blasphemous okay. one then blasphemous two i want to play uh, ender lilies it's another one that got a lot of hype that's uh been doing very well um and there is the follow-up to team ladybugs uh next metrovania so they did the record of lotus war deal in wonder labyrinth you'll remember oh you you bloody love that game uh great game and um the the follow-up got announced in a nintendo indie world recently called oh. blade chimera i think it was called um oh, yeah, yeah that really game good. Yeah, so that game, I think, is an, another Team Ladybug Metroidvania. So I'm all in on that, basically. But uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of lot of Metroidvanias for me to get through. Fist as well, the one with the rabbit with the giant fist. I've got that lined up, ready to go at some point. So yeah, a lot of lot Great of Great name for a game. <laughs> yep, F-I-S-T, just perfect, just good stuff. Um, uh, yeah, Bali, I feel like you need to get to, or we both need to get Mario RPG, but like physical comedy, that's what you're all about. I so, love uh, a bit of slapstick, my favorite. yeah. yeah. All right, our next one is Capital J from Georgia, USA, who writes, Dear Bally and MBZ, 2023 was one of the busiest years of my adult life, and thus I played far fewer games than usual. In fact, I had to combine my Switch and PC games into one list just to bring the list up to 10. Here it is. Number 10, Xuan Yun Sword 3. Number 9, Suica Game. Number 8, Gal Guardian's Demon Purge. Number 7, Axolotl. Number 6, Hi-Fi Rush. Number 5, Super Mario RPG Remake. I haven't touched Mario RPG since the SNES version came out. As an adult, I think it's kind of mediocre as an RPG, but elevated to a high level by its charm. Number 4, F-099. If there was an award for most pleasant surprise, this game would get it. Number 3, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I didn't think Nintendo could get to put another 100 hours in Breath of... or could get me to put another 100 hours into Breath of Wild's Hyrule, but they managed to pull it off. However, I really want something completely fresh next time. Number 2, Forza Motorsport. I got a wheel and pedal set to play this game, and it's a blast. And number one, Super Mario Bros. Wonder. Out of all the games i played this year, this one put a smile on my face the most consistently. For that alone, it takes number one. It's been great celebrating another year of gaming with you guys in the TNL community. Happy holidays, Capsule J. Um, well, yeah, Capsule J, once again, in there with a game I've never heard of with Shun 1 <laughs> Sword 3. So keep up the streak. Keep it up. Uh, I know no stuff. one else that can like name games that MBZ has never heard of quite uh-huh. like Capsule J. It's, it's a really impressive talent. Like, yeah, it's, it's hard work. Skill. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Our next one's from Matria from Discord. It says, hey, guys, thanks for another great year of podcasts. I'm sure 2024 will be no different. I haven't gotten around to all the Nintendo games I wish I had this year. As such, I'm just ranking everything I've played 
Buffalo. Number seven, Fire Emblem Engage Xenolog DLC. Number six, Pokemon Scarlet Teal Mask DLC. Number five, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Waves 4 through 6. Number four, Fire Emblem Engage. Number three, Pikmin 4, my first Pikmin game, and it was fantastic. Number two, Tears of the Kingdom. Only 70 hours in and I haven't seen credits yet, so take this with a pinch of salt. However, the fact I haven't finished it speaks volumes given that I couldn't put Breath of the Wild down for months. It sadly just didn't recapture the magic of the original, but is still a great game. Number one, Octopath Traveler 2. This was the year of follow-ups to some of my favorite Switch games, and while Engage and Tears of the Kingdom didn't come close to Three Houses and Breath of the Wild, Octopath Traveler 2 is a big upgrade to the first. I spent 120 hours with this game, and not one do I regret. Good stuff. Uh, I forgot that they even did DLC for Fire Emblem Engage. <laughs> I, honestly, I, I keep forgetting Fire Emblem Engage came out this year. Uh, but uh, I've heard that theme yeah. across a few podcasts I listened to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, People surprised yeah. that they had spent like 40 hours with Fire Emblem Engage, and then, like, oh yeah, yeah, that happened this um, year. But some bigger Octopath Traveler 2, love. Yeah, there we oh, go. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. How that goes. Uh, All right, our last list uh, for the year is Matt Lorigan, who writes in and says, Hey, NBC and Bally, congrats on another year of TNL. Made for great listening once again. It's been a big old year for Nintendo games. Got a goody list below for you. So, at number 10, F099. Number 9, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass. Number 8, Chance of Sainar. Number 7, Sea of Stars. Number 6, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, an impeccably designed game that loses a lot of its luster thanks to the reused open world. Might even have been lower, but the finale is one of the best bits of any Zelda game. Number 5, Pikmin 4. I think I prefer the smaller scale of Pikmin 3. I could have done without the night missions, but this is the most content-rich Pikmin game ever, and it plays very well. Number 4, Advance Wars Reboot Camp, a lovely slice of GBA strategy which made way more improvements to the original than I expected. Number 3, Dredge, an absolutely brilliant fishing game with some excellent horror writing and a suitably spooky setting. Made me want to start reading Eldritch Horror again. The script accomplished so much with so few words. Number two, Super Mario Bros. Wonder. It's a cliche to say at this point, but it's the best 2D Mario since Super Mario World. Endlessly creative and visually distinct from previous Mario titles. The only issue was the lack of surprise factor going into the later levels once you knew there was always a Wonder Seed and only a few secret exits. Super Mario World's map design is still superior, I reckon, but otherwise this was almost faultless. And number one... Metroid Prime Remastered, the best version of an already fantastic game, the most technically impressive game on Switch by such a long way, and the new controls make it such a breeze to play. The atmosphere and immersion is top notch over 20 years later, and I'm so excited to see what Retro can do with Metroid Prime 4. There you go. There you have it. Great number one there. Um, Great one. uh Yeah, everyone's favorite. A couple of games there that people have been talking about that I need to get to. Chance of Sainar, a big Mm. one that everyone's going mad about. Uh, Dredge as well. Uh, Are you keen on Dredge? I'm interested in Dredge. I wouldn't say I'm very keen. I feel like Dredge is a ballet game. uh, Well, I hate horror, but I love a bit of fishing and I loved Moonglow Bay. And this is like Moonglow Bay, but horror. Dredge is your paranormal site, right? Because like I was like, oh fucking all that visual novel shit, give it to me, but it's got horror. Oh, don't want to do it. Then I did it, and it was great. So I think Dredge is is kind of uh, that for you. I think Dredge runs well on Switch as well. So yeah, I think so. I I really should get to it. Um, Yeah, I'll 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 deal with a bit of horror just for a bit of fishing yeah definitely. yeah i think so i think i think it's probably manageable right yeah it's, it's, it's be... eldritch horror right so it's not yeah. like horror horror i don't, oh, know. I don't, I don't know. know anything about yeah. horror but yeah no no exactly um lovely well thank you everybody for writing in a uh, bunch of uh, interesting games in there fun some stuff. interesting themes mm-hmm. picked up yes. for sure yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, good to see some games that we've evangelized on the show showing up in our listeners. Oh, yeah. A lot of love for Cocoon, which is nice to see. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Um, but that is going to do us for the first part of the show. Don't go anywhere, though, because we'll be back right after this break with our top 10 games of the year. You'll not want to miss it. Be back in a bit.
Alright everybody, welcome back to the second part of today's show, the last segment of the year. <laughs> it's time for our game of the year, Bally. Uh, so, how about you lay out what that means? What are we sure. doing here? How's it going to go down? So, we are going to make a combined top 10 list of games that were, came out on Nintendo platforms this year. Yeah, so these I've played some of these games. You've played some of these games. A lot of these games, both of us have played. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're gonna negotiate and make a combined list. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I guess uh, one thing to get out of the way first of all is that uh, there is a game that we will not be including here that a lot of our listeners included. If you listen to the last segment in their games of the year, uh, that game is Cocoon. Uh, we considered Cocoon for our non-Tendo game of the year. Um, Mainly for the reason that Cocoon as a game experience is best experienced on hardware that can run it properly and does not make it uh, a bit less of an experience, I would say. I'd say so much of the experience of that game is smooth frame rate and fluidity and just visual splendor, all that sort of stuff. And that just isn't really the case on Switch. Um, and sometimes this happens with games where like Bloodstained was a weird case where it's not very good on Switch. And so it's just a bit of a weird one. Witcher 3 is an interesting one. There's, there's lots of cases out there. People take them, you know, at their own kind of discretion. And we, we kind of do a case by case basis when it comes to this stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you want to hear us talk about Cocoon, that is part of our Patreon show, uh, Nintendo, this Nintendo Life. So you can go and listen to that. That's already out. Um, For a single but, uh, dollar. Absolutely, so you can go ahead and listen to that. But uh, unfortunately, yes, Cocoon is not going to be partaking in this fight, um, which in some ways I'm thankful for because it might have just made it even more bloody. So uh, uh, it's all good. It's it would all have good. been controversial. But... Uh-huh. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's been saved uh, a spat, let's say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Bali, do you want to read down the list of yeah. games that we have for consideration this year? We have 19 games this year to become a top 10, and they are in, in alphabetical order. A Space for the Unbound, Advance Wars Reboot Camp, Blanc, Dordogne, oh, two French games back to nice, F099, nice. Fire Emblem Engage, Headbangers Rhythm Royale, Octopath Traveler 2, Onion Assault, Pikmin 4, Paranormal Sight, The Seven Mysteries of Honjo, uh, Sea of Stars, Suica Game, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, Thirsty Suitors, Venba, Wargroove 2, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Future Redeemed. All righty. Um, so, Whew. some good stuff in here. Um, I think there's some easy... A uh, little bit of pushing, a little say. bit of hacking. Yeah, I think there's some easy cuts here that we can make uh, with... Shall I start? You know, uh, yeah, go ahead. You go. Um, I don't think Advance Wars Reboot Camp should be in this top 10. I, I was going to uh, question as well, because you did consider it for your last list last time. I covered both those games in my Go TT Dakota um it's a solid remake it doesn't reinvent the formula at all and arguably some people have said the art style is even worse i'm not sure i would say that necessarily i think the art style is good it works Mm -hmm. well in like a modern setting that isn't pixel art but i think there are definitely 10 games that are better and it's never that great having remakes on the this list and if it was a remake that really reinvented it and improved on the game then i'd feel more strongly Uh, but everyone knows i already love advanced wars and i think that i'm happy given that i covered it in goatee to goatee last um episode to to make it a Mm -hmm. sacrificial cut to start that makes sense yeah also like if i think it's different if we had not played it before so if it was like if it was super mario rpg i might say let's consider oh yeah this because it we've not played it before and it was a new release this year so yeah um but no i appreciate you putting that onto the spike i think there's less deserving games than advanced wars if i'm honest so no i um, I agree with that as well but i I, it was just a a a goodwill act all right i see how you up to later okay all right okay (laughs) okay um i think we should cut onion assault um so for those who don't know onion assault is the next game by bertel horberg one of our favorite uh indie devs he made gunman clive uh, the gunman clive games it seems like he might be working on gunman clive 3 yeah it seems like he's working on a follow-up um which would be very cool but um i did not get on with onion assault it's kind of trying to be super mario brothers 2 as in doki doki panic uh with its jumping on enemies heads picking things up throwing them level design's a little clunky the checkpointing is almost non-existent 
um, really just old school archaic design in a bad way um, and just really disappointed me unfortunately this last couple of games have not been for me I think the previous one uh, Super Punch Patrol also not for me because it was a side scroll and beat em up and also had some of that old school design tendency that I just really bounce off of um, you know if you're going to make a game that is old school you need to bring it up to standard with kind of modern sensibilities and playability and I just didn't think Onion Assault managed to do that at all so unfortunately uh, I think we should cut it off the yep. list yeah we need my extermination force back uh, exactly where's my extermination force 2 that's the real oh, oh that's yeah that's the goatee um can i cut blanc you can yes i i liked blanc i enjoyed i think more enjoyed it for just playing a co-op game as opposed to anything else yeah, but no um, something we don't do enough is just no. like hop online play a co-op game and it was kind of that that early point in the year where it's like you get a bit itchy when you've not played a game that's come out that year yet and Little did we know that 2023 was going to hit us like a tidal wave, but uh -huh. um, it did in the end. But before that wave came, um, we did play, and I had an okay time with Blanc, but um, yeah. it, it, it was... I think it was going well up until the point where we had to fucking get those little ducklings oh, through the wind God. tunnel. The fucking wind tunnel Just with the, the ducklings. The clunkiest puzzle thing and it wasn't even yeah. a it was the execution of it it wasn't it was even execution. working it out it was it's just... the worst part of puzzle games where you know exactly what you have to do but you're it's impossible to actually execute on what you need to do because the mechanics are not working in your favor um for those who don't know blanc is a kind of co-op puzzle game where one of you plays a little dog one of you plays a little deer and you're just on an adventure together a little bit kind of it takes two uh, influence there i guess with like two yeah. different characters with two different abilities um it didn't run the best on switch it, the online was fine but it just was a little bit chuggy uh but yeah i think it was just a little jank in certain mechanical aspects that made it frustrating to engage with and like you know ai stuff where there was parts where we had to follow these other two deer and dogs you know mirror versions of ourselves to follow us and they just weren't following us and yeah it, it fell apart a little bit quickly but it was short and sweet and i enjoyed my time with it but yes yeah, it doesn't mm -hmm. really kind of get close to a top 10 ranking here unfortunately yeah so. yeah do you want to hack at anything else or shall we push up a few? um i let me see i i think i'm going to take dordogne off the list as okay. well uh I liked Dordogne well enough. It was a neat little uh, kind of narrative game. Uh, has a beautiful art style, somewhat similar to Blanc in its kind of, not jank approach, but you can kind of see the seams in it. Um, French. It's, <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. The, the two <laughs> French indies that were a little jank, a little bit okay. Um, Best French yeah. game of the year, not on this list. Jusson. No. That's the French game of the year. That's true. Yeah, Blanc, Dordogne, and Jusson. It was a real French year for games, <laughs> Jesus never even thought about it you're right valley um so yeah dordogne was was fun it was a it's kind of like a uh a narrative story about a young girl who lives with her grandmother in france uh but then she also revisits that house as an older woman and uh she kind of relives the past through memories as she goes through old stuff and all that sort of um thing and uh yeah it's it's neat it has a cool kind of short story to it but it never really moved me never really you know sometimes it happens with these games like i, I think it was um a memoir blue was one that i played a couple of years ago i was like it just it just was there you know and sometimes there are those indies that are just like they exist and they tell a quote-unquote emotional story but they never really actually hit with that story at all mm. um i think that's the struggle because really the thing that those games can elevate themselves with is writing and if the writing isn't there then the rest of it just isn't whole enough to stack up and i think that was the case with dordogne where it was like you know it was, it was fun enough to engage with but it was just not mentally taxing or not you know doing anything significant and the writing didn't stand up so it just didn't didn't punch through but um yeah was yeah. neat well as per mbz we've quickly reached the point where you've played more games than me and uh -huh. i don't want to hack at your babies okay. so how about we push up a few things okay sure yeah let's do could it. i push up the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Oh, I don't know, man. It's, uh, is it going to make it? It's really going to... Uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's put it up there. Uh, <laughs> the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Um, cool. Uh, I think we should push up Super Mario Brothers Wonder. <laughs> Look at that. It's Mario and Zelda on a list. There we go. Together. Wow. What a surprise. What a shocker. Um, all right. Do you want to push up another one? Or should... Uh... I think we should the... push up Pikmin 4. I agree. Let's push up 
ye old Pikmin 4, my good old buddy old friend, Pikmin 4. Up he goes. Um, okay. Um, I, I'll i cut something. Okay. Um, I'll cut Headbangers Rhythm Royale. Uh, I thought Headbangers was a fun little jaunt um i won it very quickly maybe the fastest i've won a battle royale game um i don't know if this is because i'm good at rhythm games or everyone is terrible at them i'm not sure uh but it wasn't that difficult um and as tends to be the case with battle royale games once you've won it's like what's the point anymore it's, you know it's like a bunch of kids getting free stuff day one and yeah they're really bad at games <laughs> yeah exactly uh so i'm just like well do I really want to keep playing this? And yeah, I guess there's some fun in coming back and seeing if they update it and add new rhythm stuff to it, new rhythm mini games. Um, they were fun to engage with. I never found them too challenging or uh, anything along those lines, but it was, uh, it was, it's neat and it's goofy. I think the most fun thing about it is that your pigeon looks like a penis and you just like flop the head around a bunch and they all scream and shout and I don't know. There's a, there's a chaotic energy to headbangers uh, that I appreciated, but yeah, I don't think it makes it onto a list. So let's cut it. Fair enough. Uh, okay. Uh, any further thoughts here, Bowie, uh, on things that might mm. want to be in a top 10 or might not want to be in a top 10? How do you feel about pushing up Octopath Traveler 2? You know, Bowie, you know, I'll let you do it. I'll, yeah, let, let, I'll, let, you do, I'll <laughs> let you do it. I'll let you do it. Let's push up Octopath Traveler. I'll let you do it. But it does feel unfair of me pushing stuff up and you cutting stuff off. So definitely your turn to push something up if... Uh, sure. Okay. In that case, nothing's fixed. Remember, look, everything can still come down. In that case, Xenoblade Chronicle Future Redeemed. Oh, put God, it on okay, the fucking right. list. You want to put go it on there? the fucking okay. list, my we friend. Can do it for now. Uh, oh, it's not just for now. It's for forever. <laughs> okay. It's not moving. It's staying there. It's okay. Uh, yeah. um, okay. Cool. Um, um, so we've already got five games in the mm -hmm. top chunk, and we're yep. left with. A Space for the Unbound, F099, yeah. Fire Emblem mm -hmm. Engage, yeah. Paranormal Sight, The Seven Mysteries of Honjo, uh -huh. Sea of Stars, Suica Game, Thirsty Suitors, Venba, and Wargroove 2. I will cut Thirsty Suitors from the list. Okay. Um, I like that game from a narrative perspective. I think it has really good voice acting, dialogue, writing, cultural references, uh, representation, all that sort of stuff is great. Playing the game is, uh, is okay. Um, like, it's... I feel like the problem is that it's a turn-based RPG, but it's very slow, uh, and it's not fun to engage with regular battles, so I just always avoided them. And then the boss fights... I like the premise of fighting your exes and having a conversation and making up, like, while you fight, but it means the fights are so elongated and they take such a long time. Um, and, I don't know, just something about the balancing with the health bars and how much damage you do. And it, it eventually becomes quite an easy game of not rock, paper, scissors, but, like, it's kind of Pokemon of, like, you reveal a weakness and it's like, okay, now I'm going to use the most powerful attack I have until my MP is low and then I'll just attack to get my, well, I'll use an item to get my MP up and then just kind of rinse repeat. Um, I think it's just a little underbaked in that sense. Like, all the writing characters, world, all that stuff is great, but the kind of the moving around the skateboard is a little rudimentary and the the combat just just feels a little tacked on. The thing I do like is the cooking mini game. The cooking mini game is fun. Um, it gets very repetitive after a while as you do the same actions again and again. It has a bit of a rhythm element to it. The best part about the cooking is the conversations that you have. So, so it's a weird thing where everything feels like it takes too long, but the parts that take too long are good because they're well written. So it's it's a bit of a dichotomy. I just think it it struggles as a game as trying to be a bit too gamey as it being a bit too rpg i think it would be better if it was just a bit more of a straight ahead narrative game and didn't have like turn-based combat in it i think that just kind of drags it down a little bit makes it a little bit too mm. plodding um but i did i did like it so it's it's good um so yeah thirsty suit is not going to make it onto the list um okay but i feel like there's two games on here that you would like to be on a list um oh yeah but, but it, I mean, there's a lot of good games here, and like I appreciate yeah. you're trying to defend a lot versus my smaller number. And I, how about we're we push already one on up. five slots left if we were yeah. to keep those five up top? So it's, it's how about it's already we tight. push one up that I think we can both agree on? Uh, I think we should put Vemba into the top ten. I think we should. Yeah, I, I'd be up for that. Okay, let's do it. Let's put Vemba into top ten. Yeah, I think that goes up pretty nicely um okay uh i am going to cut 
Suica game. I'm going to cut Suica game. Okay. Uh, it's a fun little distraction. It was cool. I played it until I got the watermelon. Um, you know, one day I will get two watermelons and I'll beat Nick's high score. That's the goal, really. At the end of the day, there's no other reason to play it. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I uh, I did. I did like, I think it's really good. I think it's really good. Like the physics is fun. Um, and, you know, just trying to match things up. I... You know, I've never been like a traditional puzzle kind of person. I I'm weirdly got very into Tetris the last couple of years just because I have it on my Ambonic. And so if I'm on a train, my go-to game is usually just playing Tetris on my Ambonic. Like it's very easy to boot up and play and you don't need to pay attention too much. I mean, you do because Tetris, but uh, I've weirdly gotten into Tetris uh, and uh, Suica game is basically what if it was Tetris, but with physics and fruit, essentially. Um, and I, I like it. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great, if you got 10 minutes before bed, just boot it up play around and then go to sleep and i think that that works quite nicely so but i don't think it quite has the metal to belong here so it shall not it shall um not. i mean i would love all groove two up here mm-hmm. yeah no i'm, I'm happy to move it up. it up for now yeah i have to move it up i think it is a uh it's a bally ass bally game in a, in a very bally ass bally year it is very true like, even yeah. across this list and our non-tender list like, there's a lot of yeah. bally ass bally games there's a lot of them um okay i there's a game i really want on here i think should be on here i would like to have a space for the unbound on this list okay that is what i would want to push up out of these games um, can definitely do that for now yeah all right let's put it on there um and yeah now we've got a few more we have how many one two eight three. in the top group so we've got two more should i just read out like eight currently no sure. particular order zelda tears of the kingdom mario brothers wonder pikmin 4 octopath traveler 2 xenoblade chronicles 3 feature redeemed venba wargroove 2 a space for the unbound okay um i struggling a little bit i think that Sea of Stars is really good. I really like Sea of Stars a lot. It's the um, one. It's the game on this list I've not played that I want to play the most. It, it's the game that I think out of these remaining here that you haven't played is the one that you would come away from the most interested in and excited for. Um, so if we're talking about future Bali uh, implications on this list, then Sea of Stars makes sense. I really like Paranormal Sight. I think Paranormal Sight is a really good visual novel horror themed has a good kind of like twistiness to it um great voice acting all that sort of stuff actually does it have i don't think it actually has voice acting there's no voice acting just ignore what i said <laughs> there's none i've just invented voice acting in my head um it's it's, it's really good um I don't know that it makes it i i feel like this might be sea of stars and f-099 i think that might be it um and that means that fire emblem engage is not going to be in this top 10 now this is a game that i've played i think 85 hours of earlier this year i've been saying that before the start of this year yeah so like i remember fire emblem engage like when i was playing it, i was like yeah i'm into this this is just classic old ass fire emblem you're just doing maps you're going forward and just the further I've gotten from it, first of all, I just forgot I played it. I, second of all, I've forgotten every character who exists in the game. I don't know any of them, um, except for Etier, who's my Switch emblem uh, avatar uh, on Switch. That's the only character I remember. Um, and I, I find this weird place where it is, on one hand, normal is way too easy, and then hard is just a bit too punishing in a way mm. that's not as fun and I think some of the difficulty comes from endless reinforcement spawns, which is my least favorite thing. Things just keep chasing you nonstop around the level that are hard to deal with, they're annoying. And I kind of think I like about Fire Emblem is kind of methodically taking sections of the map out and dealing with them and then moving on, leveling up, all that sort of stuff. And Engage just doesn't let you do that. It, it makes you run. It forces you to run away and chase. And I don't know, it just didn't vibe with me as much, I would say. Um, and yeah, like I think it Did you having... need more tea parties? Yeah, the tea party that's the thing. Like the 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 lack of narrative I didn't think would bother me as much. But even in the narrative the kind of like the games of the GBA era that I thought had like weaker narratives. I booted up um F E seven recently, like a few months ago, on Switch because it came out on Switch online. And I was like, this this writing's actually pretty good and like there's some nice characterization here and like 
you know, I'd forgotten because I'd never really paid attention to it too much when I was younger. But like, it, I think it actually has a a more cohesive, interesting story, political world than anything Engage tries to do. Engage is just, it's so vapid. Vapid is like the perfect word for it. It's just absolutely empty of any characterization, narrative. It's just boring, boring, bland, nothingness. And I think it says to me, narrative is actually a really important part of the Fire Emblem experience and something that actually makes me like those games more than I maybe care to admit. Um, and like makes me realize like I, I do like three houses a lot more than engage because it it does have a great story and characters and all that sort of stuff and it is there's there's an incentive right to going out on the battlefield leveling up your character relationships and then you come back home and you're like oh i'm actually excited to see these conversations because they're, they're really well written and they're interesting and they kind of engage with characters and uh this again like none of the conversations are interesting at all and so it's like okay i get back i kind of do my chores and then I just do another fight. And, you know, the fights are great. Uh, and maps are really good. But, again, there's that weird tension struggle between it being just overly punishing or too easy. And I, I restarted this game, like, four times in different ways of, like, started it on hard. But then if you drop back... It's another stupid difficulty thing. If you drop to normal, you can't go back up to hard. It's so fucking stupid. It's such oh, infuriating God. bullshit. It's so stupid. Um, and I, Nintendo needs to out their own fucking way with stuff like that it's just really frustrating um so gosh i mean it doesn't i don't think it makes it <laughs> honestly i think i've talked myself into like no i don't think as much as i put so many hours into fire emblem engage i just don't i just don't see it making this list so i, I also i don't know if it'll make my top 10 this year it's, it's a competitive year it's, it's tricky it's a tough year very, there's very some very good games not making my top 10 yeah yeah so I, I think I think this is F099 and Sea of Stars, and we drop Paranormal Sight, I think. Um, okay. Which, you know, that I'm fine with. I, the Paranormal Sight, I think, is very good. I think there are visual novels I like more than it. Um, it does... It has done... This year, it did the coolest thing I've seen a video game do this year, which I talked about on the episode I talked about it. Uh, it's fucking cool. It does some really neat stuff. I wish it did a little bit more of that stuff. Um... But, yeah, I, I, I feel like it is it's one of those where it's a, it's a bit more straight ahead with what it's trying to do at the end of the day. And there's less there's less wild swings with, like, what Danganronpa does and those types of games do in terms of their endings and their twists and their reveals. It feels like this game sets you up and they're like, oh, that guy kind of looks like the guy. And, oh, guess what? It's the guy. Like, you know, it, 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 it kind of doesn't lead you down... A rabbit hole and then says aha actually it was this all along it's like oh no it, it's teasing you out and it's more it's more about the character relationships and the three different groups that you engage with and what their motivations are and why they're doing what they're doing um and yeah it just has a unique identity to it and i'd really i hope square enix kind of continues down this path of letting whatever team made this do visual novels because i think with a bit more budget uh let them have voice acting next time and all that sort of stuff they can do something really cool and uh yeah i don't know i think it's i think it's testament to a game where it was jump scaring me and scaring me a lot that i pushed through and played it because i was so engaged with the narrative that it was it was spinning and all the kind of weird wonderful things it does um and a very cool uh, ending as well i think that the ending does do a neat trick uh that is meta and fun and yeah i think it's it's up there as one of the visual novels that I've enjoyed quite a bit, um, but maybe not in the upper echelon. Uh, so, yeah, Paranormal Sight. Okay. Hat tipped to thee. So that means we have 10 games. Yeah. That was Do, quite easy. Are we happy with these 10, and is there anything in the red that should be in the 10? Shall I go through the 10? Yeah, in, go through the 10. In the black? So you're the top 10 at the moment in no particular order. Tears of the Kingdom, Mario Brothers Wonder, Pikmin 4, Octopath Traveler 2, Xenoblade Chronicles 3, Venba, Wargroove 2, A Space for the Unbound, F-099, and Sea of Stars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. All looks good to me. Well, MBZ, um, I must say, yeah. there's a hell of a lot of MBZ games in the red, so yeah, that's very noble of you. Well, I think, honestly, like none of these I was super passionate about. I mean, I was. Like, I, I do really like Paranormal Sight, but... 
I mean, I, I'm not going to knock off F Zero ninety nine. Like when Nintendo giving you scraps, you know, about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it, it deserves to be on here. And I think it's a very cool thing. Um, so I I think that that probably makes the most sense. Um, okay. And yeah, yeah, I think I think like Sea of Stars, Paranormal Sight, Fire Emblem Engage. They're all kind of like on a level for me. I, I would say Sea of Stars probably does edge it though uh, over those games. So even mm. if it is the one that you are more interested in, I do think it's probably the one I was most engaged with uh, overall as well. So yeah, cool. I think it, it deserves to be there probably. Should we um, try and think about a number 10 or do mm -hmm. we want to try and do a top five, bottom five? Um, yeah, I think, I think a number 10 is good. Um for me, I think Sea of Stars is probably a number 10. Um, I like Sea of Stars a great deal. I think, for me, it's the inferior of the two throwback RPGs of recent times. Chained Echoes is just much higher in my mind. I just think it's a lot better as a game. Um, sea of Stars is prettier. It has a more engaging environment to run around in. It's, at the end of the day, I think you'll like it more than you like, mm. like Chained Echoes. I love if a bit you were of to presentation. Play them both. Yeah, you're very... Um, yeah, visual and music and all that sort of stuff. And Sea of Stars has that in You're like mechanics, bounds. speed, pace. Yes. Throw myself yeah, into exactly. a situation. Exactly. And and Sea of Stars I think Sea of Stars is still a really interesting game in terms of its combat system. Um I th I think it just gets a little not rote, but you tend to do the same things and fight together. And again, the very the variety comes from the different patterns that the enemies have. And so you're learning new timings for blocking and using your attacks, right? because um, mm. that's the whole Mario RPG system that sea of stars has going on which is fun and um it you know, the, th the one thing i like about it actually is it it's similar to those mario rpg games in the sense that the numbers start very low and they don't go very high right it's like you do one damage you take two damage right like it's not he's 700 and then you do 2000 it's like it's not octopath traveler 2 where it's like okay i'm going to do 13,000, then 23,000. you know like um the numbers stay reasonable it's not a square enix rpg right they're not gonna go crazy with numbers popping off um but um yeah it has interesting systems like you um if you faint on the ground you have to wait like a couple of turns and then you'll auto revive so there's like a kind of hanging on and not necessarily using an item if you don't want to if you think that you're able to survive it without then you can kind of hang on to it uh, by a thread and yeah that stuff is very neat um i was just listening to giant bombs music uh, game of the year episode and uh, they played a bunch of stuff from sea of stars i was like yeah this soundtrack does slap mm -hmm. like it's, it's got some really good tunes in it um of course uh, a bit of uh the messenger influence in there and uh, some crossover tracks from that game as well but yes yeah, it's just uh, it's just a really well presented well made enjoyable experience and it's a bit long it's a little over long um and yeah i think the, the middle of it gets a little bit saggy but it ends very very strong and um yeah i think i, I enjoyed it for the simple story that it, it has and it's mainly like <sighs> does kind of not zelda dungeon but kind of zelda dungeon stuff it feels kind of a cousin of golden sun in a way right. where it's yeah like, i've heard that yeah like using overworld stuff but still doing rpg fights um i like that the idea of that um, i think it's it's a very bally kind of game it's definitely my january game this is the yeah. first game i want to get to in january on game mm -hmm. pass so yeah, yeah look forward to it i think it probably is number 10 okay cool. i'm cool. happy we're at number 10 at the moment okay. cool um i think nine's trickier uh, yeah yeah i i love f-099 uh-huh but there are a lot of games on this list i love more yes um i agree and I, and I know games in and around f-099 like a space for the unbound i know you mm -hmm. love that game oh yeah Vember, wargroove 2 i I, pre I prefer wargroove 2 above f-099 like okay it's just my jam it's maybe my fate out of like all the advanced wars games the two wargroove games I do think Wargroove 2 is probably the best. Like, it is really, yeah. really good. And mm -hmm. it's a leaner campaign. It didn't feel at the start like it was going to be a leaner campaign, but it ended up being a leaner campaign. And I really love that game. Um, equally, F-099 is the F-Zero game I didn't know that I needed. <laughs> like it, yeah, yeah, it just it came out of nowhere. Yeah, I was a little bit sad that, like, why is this, like, an online-only game? Why is this... It, online only in my mind feels so temporary and part right. of me is frustrated by that but at the same time i jumped in and i i've only played about 12 hours of this game only but, 12 hours only that's 12 a lot hours. for but, um, even this year so but it has been a very busy year and i've been wrapping up a lot of other games mainly tears of the kingdom and especially throughout november december so 
but like F-099, there's something special about that thrill of going through the final corners and potentially being in the mix to win like a 99 racer race against real people. It's like, that's a racing thrill that no other F-Zero game has ever given me. Like, easily. Mm. Easily. And when you think about the lore of F-Zero and it's, it's basically like exploding Wild West kind of cars. Like, this is a death race, a death match. Like, that's what this game feels like. So I think in terms of like what F-Zero should feel like, you are feeling that as a player. It's a lot more higher stakes. Whereas playing against computers, whether that's F-Zero GX or Maximum Velocity on Game Boy Advance, like both fantastic games. But F-Zero 99 is doing something more evo- ev- ev- evocative than those games. Something that makes you actually feel like a ri- like racing. Like Maybe I love those games more than F-Zero 99. I'm not saying F-Zero 99 is necessarily better. I, I, I've not decided that. But F-Zero 99 is really special. And I think like the use, the solution of using the sky lanes to like, you know, avoid all the, the traffic is just a great idea to still have a 99 person racer and still be rewarded for good driving like it, it's about finding space it's about getting ahead of the pack it's about you're rewarded for weaving through the pack or you're rewarded for staying in the pack taking all the the gold the, the yellow like orbs that get you into the skyline going in the skyline overtaking everyone and then like winning the race and boosting at the right time doing all these things like having the boost system from gx where you're health is the same as the amount of boost you have left is the perfect risk reward mechanic like and arguably in most video games i can think of like it's just such a great mechanic that i'm glad they introduced into the kind of super nintendo style of game whereas it's only to my knowledge been in well, f-zero x and gx that only had it so like i i f-zero 99 is really special but if it ends up at nine it ends up at nine because we need to hear what you have to think about like space view unbound we could talk yeah. about vember but like I said, I'd like to see Wargroove 2 above F-Zero, if possible, but we can okay. get there. Yeah, I think it sits at, at nine nicely. I feel like there's more passion for everything else on this list as a total. Like, I suppose for The Unbound is a really remarkably well done narrative game. It's got absolutely stunning visual art. Um, it has these like little moments, these sequences, these vignettes um, that are done in a different kind of 2D art style um there's the i can't remember if i talked about this on the show the one where you're the two of you are sitting in a cinema and there's a popcorn uh thing in between and you like press a button to like reach over and get the popcorn and then you accidentally do it and you're like touching hands together it's a very cute like fun little moment it's done in a completely different visual style um to the rest of the game um it has a big night in the woods energy like just walking around a town mm. getting to know a town getting to know a space knowing the map and the roads and it's a it's not more 3d but like there's more you go along a road and then you go you press up right to go up another road and then you're sideways again on it and you press up to go into a house or whatever so it's a bit more exploring the space there's the school um i think just like the setting comes across really strongly like it's a it's a very unique um location that you don't see in games represented very often and i think that the culture like it's been a few games like that like chia earlier this year that was based on new caledonia like i think this game represents indonesia very well uh, and is is very kind of has an identity uh that comes across strongly because of the people who made it you know um and they are they're speaking to a time and a place right uh, in which this game was made and i think it it has that kind of charm in spades uh very unique kind of interesting mechanic of going into people's heads solving puzzles there's a little bit of kind of like not frustration but there's a there's a bit of kind of um figuring out what you need to do where you need to go sometimes um and yeah it can again like in the middle of it maybe gets a little bit baggy at times um maybe in a similar way to sea of stars but nowhere near as long as as that but i think it ends extremely well very very strong very powerful emotional ending um says a lot about art about uh being a creative um just like it, it deals with a lot of stuff a lot of heavy topics a lot of, a lot of tough stuff and i think it comes out really well on the other side and a really wonderful soundtrack as well just just beautiful music so um it just it's it's a vibe of a game in a, in a strong way um and yeah it's it's I, I really enjoyed it i think it's it's a tremendous uh experience so yeah i i would like to see it 
high on this list um the question is does it stand up to dogs and hats who can bite people uh, <laughs> in a in a line i don't know what about vember i love vember as well i think i think space for the unbound probably pips vember for me from a narrative perspective um vember though is a very personal game i think for me right like it, it just touching my own culture in a in a fun way uh and a not fun way as well like it's a yeah you know it's, a, it's a, a fun really not fun in that game <laughs> yeah it's it's you know it's it's oh, it's a bummer of a game in a lot of ways right yeah there's, yeah there's just moments that hit so strongly and you're it's like oh. i was having a good time cooking and now yeah i'm not the music is also really good like i'm not someone who listens to indian music very much because I, I don't i'm not that into it but the music they chose or wrote for this game is like it works it mixes like modern sensibilities with indian style music and there are like tracks that i've gone back and listened to because i'm like this is it's a fucking jam like it's really good um and yeah just seeing those dishes uh being made and represented the the fucking sound design like if we're talking about a runner-up to best sound design in 2023 there's like a percussion to some of the when you're making the dishes mm. that you know it's making beats and drum sounds and other other, other like clinking sounds and the music and you mean the music no the 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 sound design of the cooking right and that the, that sound complements a lot of the music so mm -hmm. well yeah not, it's not obviously completely rhythmical they're two different things but right. there's this like this kind of unique fusion of the sound design with the music in the, in those moments that i think is very strong yeah yeah no i was gonna say like cocoon and venber are the two sound design games of the year for me um yeah. like the sound of just like stuff popping and the sizzling mm. the sound oh, of fucking yeah. onion sizzling is holy shit like <laughs> it, it sounds so good um it's like they it properly has... sizzled something and got the mic in just oh, the right yeah. place like they've really worked on that yeah I, I think what happened was that they cooked all these dishes and you know whoever was working on sound design recorded as they were cooking the dishes live right um which just lends it such an authentic feel um and uh yeah again like the visual style is, is super nice as well it has that there's a papery there's, there's something like symbolic about the kind of papery thin outlines of the characters the kind of the way in which a lot of these dishes as well are made from kind of less substantive materials like dosa is a thin very breakable very kind of pliable um kind of piece of not dough but like it's not even a bread it's like a pancake essentially idli is the same where it's like pockmarked with holes um I, i'd say that's you know it's an interesting kind of meditation when you think about identity and the way this game deals with that and the kind of like you know the the kind of um holes that you can put in into people and and kind of take them away from what they originally were I, it, there's there's nice kind of food narrative symbology going on there um, mm -hmm. which i think is is neat as well uh yeah i think it's i think it's really strong it's a very it's like if you talk about a one and a half hour experience like that has a message delivers it bangs in like so many different ways vember is just a super strong contender in that that way i think it's um yeah it's a game that more people need to play uh and yeah i think it's 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 a piece of art uh, it's real real good so and i think Vem vember's brevity and its message and its poignancy i think may pip a space for the unbound because like i said space for the unbound is a, it's like a 12 hour game it has like moments in the middle that are walk around the town talking with people it's good fun it's great it has excellent immaculate vibes but you do get to that point where you're like okay i want to find out what the next story beat is and sometimes you're like okay i'm gonna have to go into someone else's head to do another puzzle in order to progress this thing and it's cool um but i think there's a punchiness to vember that maybe maybe does elevate it um above so i don't know it's it's tricky um i know you love wargroove 2 a lot i, th I feel like wargroove 2 is a bally just mechanically just loving this thing yeah and i think it's hard to compare that to stuff like space for the unbound and vember which are very, very hard. emotional yeah. narrative experiences um they're very affecting very effective but yeah we can leave them where they are for now we need to think about these other games first maybe because it's all going to maybe mix up a okay bit more uh-huh do you think Vember, Wargrove 2, Space of the Unbound are touching this top five, or is that top five quite 
powerful. It, it's it's quite powerful for me. Yeah, it's quite powerful for me. Um, I, oh, gosh, I really do think Future Redeemed is like not being slapped on, but like the it's. I know it's just like a DLC for Xenoblade Three. This was is it the culmin- or February or it was DLC? like March or something. They oh, dropped it. it. Okay. Um, this is the culmination of a decade of games, really. I know it's weird that a DLC for a third game in a series is that, but the way that this has worked out, that Takahashi has finally been able to do his grand saga, perfect works. You know, he tried it with Xenogears, then he left Square Enix, so he couldn't do Xenogears anymore. Tried it with Bandai Namco, tried to do Xeno Saga, and got three parts into that, and then wasn't able to do it because they dropped it because the games weren't selling well. Finally, Nintendo buys Monolith Soft, and he's like, all right, I'm going to do his, his totally other thing. We're going to call it Monado and then somewhere in development they're like oh actually let's try and make it a xeno game so they made it xenoblade and it was a fucking smash success it's one of the cult hits uh, of nintendo and like has gone on to be beloved by many many people which get them uh, a stepping stone to get to, to two which two was the thing that really you know brought the series to a wider audience um not my favorite but a game that i think expanded the audience for the series very well and then three is just like a it's, a it's a masterpiece it's like a phenomenal piece of work um and this final piece connects it all together it takes the two worlds it takes those characters and you know the fucking feeling of walking back into colony nine and hearing that music again it's just like a nostalgia play and i think it's a little bit cheating maybe to hit me in my heartstrings like that but it does it very effectively and then has like so many little nods and references um like the very first scene of Xenoblade where Shulk and Fiora are up there eating that fucking sandwich. Like, there's a nod to that. There's a nod to the fucking moment where the spider climbs up and jump scares you. Uh, that's never acknowledged in Xenoblade 1, but they acknowledge the moment in in this DLC. Um, and it even makes Rex an interesting, cool character. Uh, which I didn't think was possible, because Rex is a dumb, fucking stupid Yorkshire boy in Xenoblade 2. And I hated his voice acting, and just did not find him an interesting character at all. But hey, what do you know, make him a buff, like... 40 something gruff yorkshire man and suddenly he's cool and interesting now um which i thought was uh worked a lot better i, I i'm glad they recast his voice he was future redeemed stuff. he was future redeemed yeah uh-huh. yeah very much so um all the kind of the new characters in this are great as well like the the quote-unquote kids of uh shulk and rex as well as matthew i'm full of beans that's what he says i'm full of beans it's great it's such a good line um and not to mention, like, the best overworld theme in any Xenoblade game. Aurora Shelf is a top-tier fucking banger of a track. I, st- I think this is an experience for many people who play this game, but you edge onto this plateau, and the music starts playing, and I just fucking stood there and listened to it. Never in any other game have I done that. I just stood, I didn't want to get into a fight, I wanted to hear the entire fucking track all the way through. It is incredible. Uh, so... So yeah, I think it's good. I think it's a good game. Uh, Future Redeemed, the DLC for Xenoblade 3. Uh, so I do, I, I do think it should be in the top five. Um, you have that in your mind above them, but Space Wargroove, Space the Unbound. Future Redeemed is my number two game of the year. Oh, God damn. Yep. Yep. God yep. Damn. It's fucking awesome. It's so, so good. Um, I just had a great time. I 100%ed it. Like, I did everything you could, which usually I wouldn't do in a Xenoblade game, but they, they kind of adapted it in a way to make it completable. Like, they added this whole kind of, like, checkmark system of ticking things off on the map, and again, my stupid brain was like, I want to do that. Um, but I think it's a really well-implemented version of that, and, like, I kept playing after credits just to tick off the last few things, because I was like, I just want to spend more time in this world, and that doesn't happen very often, so... Yeah. Future Redeemed is very up there for me on a personal level. Um, yeah. Hmm. So I think it definitely is top five. Does it go higher than that? Eh, it's, it's difficult because these other games are very, very uh, high. But as well. Should we try and cement thing not cement, so like... so far by the way the, the list is exactly as we have written it <laughs> so we haven't actually moved anything we've just been like let's keep that there and that there i know and that's the nature of us putting things up and yeah moving but i'm happy to move stuff around but we can yeah is there anything I that mean... screams out that's way too high on this list we need to drag it down i i've got one game in mind but you can uh-huh. go first if you want i don't i don't know like i I feel like probably Pikmin 4 should be higher. Um, I, I, agree. I I think, like, Pikmin 4 
is a really brilliant thing it's excellent and i think it's probably i would have it a, a oh, would i no i wouldn't oh god i don't know i think me personally i might actually have mario wonder on my list higher than pikmin 4 wow, but i really? think but i think pikmin 4 probably combined from us is higher than mario wonder so P- pikmin 4 is like pikmin was one of those series that i really liked like, I, I really loved pikmin 3 i'll admit that mm-hmm. maybe one and i hadn't played one and played a lot of two I liked two a lot, but three was just incredible. And four, I was like, okay, well, more of three. That would be good, I guess. And then it, I feel like it kind of hit it out of the park in a kind of Luigi's Mansion 3 kind of way where mm-hmm. you're expecting a not a rote sequel, but a, a fairly standard sequel. And it went above and beyond where they gave you a set of mechanics. They gave you stuff like Ochi. And then they said, right. We're going to have all these different worlds to explore. We're going to have all these levels with the, the Dandori missions. And then we're going to have the, the versus Dandori missions. And then we're going to, even going to have like a little tower defense side thing. Oh, and then there's got like more post game and more post game. Oh, and some even more post game with like different game modes where they just cemented the mechanics so strongly that they were confident enough to give you like five, six different modes that all kind of intertwined in different ways where you do have the slow, slower exploration metroidvania-ish kind of discovery of the world and it getting bigger and expanding and using cool stuff like ice pikmin to freeze a lake to then walk over it that was a really cool mechanic and ice pikmin are just generally the best i like yeah. i loved using no, them they're so much fun um and it's just kind of like ochi kind of reinvented the game quite considerably where he was so versatile you, he could be like this guy who would just fight off enemies while all the Pikmin are delivering things, or he could be the one guy you send to deliver that massive watermelon because he's got the strength of like 100 Pikmin, mm-hmm. or he could be the guy that's just shuttling between the two, doing both tasks at once. Or in my favorite thing, he's the best way to collect your Pikmin all together and not have like random stragglers die because they're trailing behind in that. That's always yeah. frustrated me in Pikmin of like fighting bosses, and I'm like, oh, but like my lagging tail basically is what costs me those Pikmin. And Ochi yeah. is a safe way of like being a bit of a turtle bitch, which I know you love to do, Bally, obviously. But I and Pikmin <laughs> mostly like to do being a turtle bitch, which is just fucking be on Ochi, collect everyone together, and then like bing, 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 you know? Like that's, yeah. it feels safe and comfy. And I like, <laughs> I like him yeah. doing that. So yeah. And there's just like great charm and animation, but there's really great boss design. I'd say there maybe wasn't quite as many unique bosses. Yeah, that's my one kind of disappointment with Pikmin 4 is it just feels like there's overworld bosses, but they often feel similar to ones that have been in the series before. It's mm. better at the back half, like after you've got the first credits, when you go for the second credits, that those later areas, I think, have a bit more of that, where yeah. you're like, oh yeah. God, there's a big guy stomping around this place. But yeah, yeah I wish there was a few more unique uh enemies in that way because the final boss was great like yeah, really unique final boss sets out of the park it was yeah, really yeah. really impressive taking all the mechanics you've learned to that point yeah i would them. have preferred the caves to have a bit more of like the end of a cave to have one of those more unique fights every single time i think would have been a good way to do it but it seems like there's just a lot of caves right there's a huge number of caves in this game That's... i loved i did really love the caves i i found them I liked the pacing because it took the time pressure off and it was just mm-hmm. kind of yes. like, right, methodical puzzle, but also actiony because you're kind of strategizing how's best to defeat this enemy. I loved the rewind in this game. It's so nice to have where if you want, you don't feel like you ever have to waste time if you like lose a bunch of Pikmin. And sometimes I'd lose Pikmin, I'd say, I'll just take it. I'm, I'm, that was my fault. Other times I'd lose a hell of a lot of Pikmin and I'd be like, yeah those are really nice pigment to have mm-hmm. i don't really want to lose those so i'll rewind yeah when like 20 of your purples get squashed you're like no nah, oh, yeah. fuck that i'm not doing that yeah. <laughs> i'm not it leaving still those guys behind a long ass time to try and get lots of purples um so i didn't know in the same way i didn't know that i needed an online only f-zero battle royale i also didn't know i needed a 40 hour pigment game <laughs> like mm, mm. initially i was a bit like 40 hours geez am i are this gonna Am I going to be interested in this till the end? And I, I that time, more or less sailed by. Like I, I yeah. was very happy to play such a long game to the point where I played the secret post game, which I thought was also really well executed and was a nice little cherry on top to the whole experience. Like I was just 
so impressed by Pikmin 4. Like it's it's very very high on this list for me. Yeah, it it just keeps on giving, uh, and I think that is a testament to like I, when I initially started playing, I was like, oh, these areas feel maybe a little smaller, more condensed, and stuff like that. And then you realize like, oh no, it just takes a long time to get through them because there's just a lot of like the, I, I do love the overworld and stuff but there's a real satisfaction to opening up the entrances to caves and then it's this weird pacing of like one day you'll come home and you'll be like oh i've only filled up two percent of the map and then the next day i'll be like i did 60 percent today because yeah. i just yeah. dove down and did all the caves and got all the tra- like pikmin 4 is a game that begs you to 100 percent it and 100 mm. percenting it is a joy frankly like, yes and i felt the same way about mario wonder i think these games are quite close for me personally they both do such a good job of being like look it's not too hard to get everything in this game and it's going to be fun to go and get everything so just go ahead and do it and it feels not wrong but it feels like you're not playing pikmin correctly if you go down those caves and you are not 100%ing each floor before moving on, right? Um, there's maybe one area where it would have been smarter of me to just move on, which is the area where the fucking invincible guy on his roller thing chases you. I did that entire area collecting everything while being chased by him and didn't go back and, you know, do it like like you did, I think, afterwards, which is the cleanup, because um, it would have mm. been much faster that way. But there was a big tension to that entire section of like, oh god, just fucking rolling guy is just coming after me and uh yeah, just that was that was a lot. But um but yeah, you you just have to you just wanna see that hundred percent thing ticked, you know? It's a it's a stupid yeah. thing again, does your brain, but I think it's satisfying to go and find everything. And especially with like some of the things that are hidden where you need to get Ochi to like sniff out the ground and pick them out for you and um yeah, it's it's really good. It's Pikmin it's really four good. Should Pikmin 4 go? Should, is Pikmin 4 better than The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, Bali? <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, we'll get all right. There. Well, maybe let's move Pikmin 4 up. I think we should maybe mention a little JRPG first. Okay, all right, okay. What do you want to do about Octopath Traveler 2? Because, uh, Bali, <laughs> I have played... I need the MBZ take on okay. Octopath Traveler 2 right, because okay. it is very impressive <laughs> you've played so much. So all let's right. hear it. I've played 62 hours of Octopath Traveler 2, and I have seven more stories to go and the final boss to go. Oh, so Jesus. let's let's say it probably will take me 80 hours to Okay, finish you were it. very confident you'd beat this game considerably faster than me. I, and I, I, I think thought I, spent, I would. I think I spent somewhere around 95 hours. Yeah, on this yeah. Game. I, it's really interesting, this game. Like, I've had ups and downs with it. I, I've generally enjoyed myself. I think it's really good um like i think you i don't say you hyped up the stories to me but you're like oh yeah, yeah yeah they do this thing and then they get you know they do a twist to it you've only found the resolution of one of them yeah resolution but you okay. know like, the journey, the journey is as a, as a, yeah i agree journey no, is super journey important is as i think important for sure. and i like i i don't know like i think there's certain ones where you're like oh and then this thing happens and you're like oh and i feel like i've got past a lot of those and i'm like they they all feel like pretty standard stories to me like they're, they're, they're fun they're well told all but i wouldn't them. say okay. yeah i wouldn't say there are any kind of breaking any conventions like um like throne A's one okay let's do light spoilers here so skip ahead uh if you don't want to hear everything for throne A before the final chapter which i don't know maybe that does something crazy but there's like oh it does <laughs> the, okay okay but the twist is oh she's uh actually the daughter of the father and but is she the real father and i'm like oh, okay cool like it's 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 neat it's it's fine i i don't i don't see any of those stories kind of elevating themselves in like a real dramatic way maybe part of it is that because it takes so long to play each of them and you know you're so separated there's been times where i've been like in a chapter and i've been like who are you again? Because I've met them in February of this year, you know, and I've just forgotten. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of um, threads for sure. Definitely. Exactly, to keep track of everything and who's doing what and everything. And like, you know, I, I've enjoyed all of them, you know, and I, I feel it's weird because despite the story being the thing that everyone's talking about and like the improvements and all that sort of stuff, I find myself liking it mechanically more than the previous game, more so. And like, I find myself just grinding levels just because it's an easy podcast game to do that with and it's fun to go after ochette's um pokemon abilities right. and find hikari 
like good mu- like i've just been i've been enjoying i've been enjoying the process of making characters powerful and broken which is the case of i went and did the arms master job so i'm like okay let's look up a guide how do i find this weapon this weapon this weapon this weapon i'm like all right i'm just gonna go listen to a podcast kill that optional boss and now i have this super you know yeah. fucking bow stuff. attack that i can do and now hikari has five of the six arms master skills and i have all the weapons associated with them that you take the rusty arms dealer and he converts them there's some good like satisfying classic rpg shit about it right where mm. you're just like i'm just gonna get the cool class and i want to use it because it's cool and now my oswald can do all of the magic except for wind because wind's annoying and i have to get <laughs> someone else for wind but he can do all the magic and he's got some cool moves and stuff like that um that stuff i don't know it's just been clicking with me a bit more and i think that's been the drive and if i'm honest i'm kind of like I'm like oh god i guess i have to play the story now you know like i'm like oh fine i have to do seven more stories i'd rather just kind of run around and grind which is a weird opposite thing to the first game because like the first game i hated it because of how grindy it was but it's so much easier to level in this game like you can you, you know if you combine uh Oswald's XP gain, Throne's at night XP gain, uh, alongside, you know, some good characters who can kill enemies quickly. There's a rhythm you can get into where you're yeah. like, I'm just gonna knock out, knock out, knock out, and I'm gonna be- go up four. They've not levels. changed any of the dynamic of like. Ideally, it'd be nice if all your characters leveled up at the same time. Yes. Instead, yes. they've been like, well, we can just make it easier and faster to level up. Yeah. Rather than actually get to the root cause of the issue but the the grind does not feel insurmountable which is what the first game felt like to me the grind in the first game felt fucking insurmountable mainly because they gave you no good areas to go to to specifically grind for your level i did have a bit of beef with this we talked about this early off mike about Mm. my beef with not having levels that were commensurate with your characters but what i kind of realized was that you can just fight weaker enemies and there's not going to be a massive xp difference like the xp difference might be like 100 or 200 but you can knock out those fast those weaker enemies so much faster like there's an efficiency thing here that is ticking that efficiency part of my brain because you know about i like to go fast in all video games yes. in every measure in whatever if you i can run also fast speed up battles which is nice exactly I, and i did not i've never had it on times one speed ever if anyone does that you're a fucking lunatic and i don't want to speak to you ever again um but that's you just know, for juice on players like us absolutely we absolutely like to go slow absolutely I, I i literally don't understand people who play this game on times one speed you are wasting hours of your life frankly. um so i really like the idea of being like i have this setup where if i encounter this set of enemies i do this move with oswald i do this move with ochette and then they're dead and then i get the xp and i'm on to the next fight and there's a satisfying efficiency problem to that of just leveling characters up my characters are all about level 50 now and i'm going into level 45 chapters which is nice because it feels like i have a little bit of a buffer a little bit of a cushion uh so i'm like okay like uh the one chapter i finished for um a character's partitio so that was the first one i did is he the and... only character you finished his entire yes. story okay yeah, exactly. what do you think so of his that... story uh, it's it's neat it's, it's it's a cool one it's a yeah. i think it's visually very interesting as well like he's very steampunky his main theme is a is a jam it's real good it's an absolute banger yeah it's, it's real so good. good um i think there's a it, you know structurally it's it, it makes sense of what it was going to be and it, it all kind of yeah. played out in that way um but it was cool i don't know i wasn't blown away by it i wasn't underwhelmed by it i thought it was good and i think that's how i feel for pretty much every one of these stories i'm like okay. they're good you know and, and I, I think i'm not there's no character you're like oh i really i'm intrigued by how their final chapter will no no none of them what's gonna I, happen i have really no intrigue or anything about any of the characters i'm like okay, okay cool maybe casty is the only one where i'm like that's the one where the thread is the most interesting I, I think oswald casty and throne of my favorite stories okay and then i say patricia's middle middle of the pack i also yeah. really enjoyed hikari's you know chapter. weirdly my favorite story is probably agnia's just because it's low stakes and fun there's and I, I totally buy that and i yeah. really do agree and i think there's a real spectacle to her final chapter that you'll enjoy. okay yeah and yeah that's something i think this game has a lot more of actually is visual and often musical spectacle mm-hmm. um I think the theming is stronger where there is a big industrial steampunk right. element. And that's yeah. obviously heavily tied to Partitio's story. But the world just feels better. Now, I'm not going to argue that the towns are more memorable and more 
No, I think they are in. more memorable from a visual distinct. They're more memorable visually. Yeah, I think yeah. they're more in visually interesting. And I think yes. the game definitely deserves a lot of credit for that. Where it's just visually really, really interesting, mm-hmm. and I, I definitely did enjoy the stories more than you obviously are. But my biggest issue with the first game was less the grinding, less those issues. Was hey, I've just completed eight character stories. Give me some like linking up resolution, goddamn. Yeah, it. and it was all behind post game that was level 75 and right. awful. And I never wanted to do that. I looked up later. This game solves that issue. And for me, that's the biggest categorical improvement where it links up some of the stories. You even have some missions. And I would have liked to have seen more of these where they have two characters doing the mission ticket, like side quest. Not, it's not side quest. What well, they've got a name. They're like two yeah, characters I, together doing so a thing. So do Am I going to get a second of those after I do all these final chapters? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. Which is wild because the, for me, there was like 60, 70 hours of gameplay in oh between God. them, and yeah. which is weird. I would have liked to have maybe three or four stages, but equally, how long is this game going to be? Because it's just Very more long. and more chapters, right? I, I think it is quite talky and a bit too verbose at times. Like it has the Japanese game problem of it's being very like, talky. oh shit there you are standing there <laughs> there in the corner there oh shit i see you there like it does it it repeats itself a lot <laughs> yeah yeah it just it does the japanese dialogue thing which i think you know tolerance for that will vary i think in a game like this because it's 2d sprites in a 3d world there's, there's less you're not seeing characters move their mouths and act in a 3d space like there's, there's less of an engagement that way and i think that is why it can grate on people more um i don't think it's terrible but i think there's definitely times where i'm like okay i'm not gonna i'm not gonna listen to you read the line i'm gonna read it myself right. and just click through it you know it happens sometimes um but i do think that voice acting is really good i think the acting is great uh, yeah and the characters are, are, are well drawn and all that sort of stuff i do i, I think actually there's an interesting this game is like basically like one half of it is an rpg the other half is a visual novel and they very don't true. really they don't really intersect very often no. like so often you'll play a section like a story section and you'll just have 40 minutes of talking and then a boss fight and there'll be no fighting in between there'll be no regular enemies or the regular enemies will be contained in a section that is so small especially with oswald because i have him with evasive maneuvers which basically reduces your uh, chance of encountering enemies i would have like maybe one enemy fight then a boss and i'd fight two things in an entire chapter and i think if i was to well, that's why you need to level up if you've got that well, turned the, on. The, yeah i know but I, also it's just annoying there's too many fucking random encounters so i actually like having oswald yeah i i hear you on that yeah um so but i think the one thing that i would improve for this series is like let me naturally level up within chapters as opposed to what i have done which is just going out and grinding between chapters because you you do have to do it i think that varies drastically between chapters but i don't think it does i think it is consistent throughout the game i've had to do it multiple times where i'm having to keep everybody in sync the whole time and it just requires grinding. It's, it's you, necessary. You have been having your characters much more similar levels than they're all the same I level. Did. Yeah, I've leveled them all right. equally. Yeah. Out there, I, t- as I they never go. did that. I just had like four top tier, four second tier, and it was okay for me to just have them on differential levels, and it, yeah. it worked fine. But I, I do hear. You. I, I think that like I just think this game definitely like stepped up everything. I do think you, you say like the bosses they don't like. You do the. You do the storytelling, then you do the boss fight. Storytelling. I, I, there's a handful of fights where they try and do a lot more, like, oh, you thought me, you had me now, and now is my actual form. And there's like, there's, there's a lot of like multi-second forms. I'm like, oh god, yeah, please. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to stay alive. There's some, there's some really tough fights in this game, actually. Um, yeah, but I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker. I think it's very, a lot of it's very cheesy. I think it's very. Oh, fun, for though. sure. It's, yeah, it's, it's great, and it's, yeah. it's a lot better than the first game though, because I think the first yeah. game was just boring, whereas these stories actually have an interesting hook to them, and there's some fun stuff going on. And I do like the moments where they play with the format, and like the Hikari chapter I just did, you play a, a bunch of flashback section of it, right? Yeah, your... it's. I like. I do really enjoy that storytelling, and yeah. That, you're right there's a hell of a lot of visual novel in here that's very talky and i was a real sucker for it and like i said four of the eight stories really gr- did grip me um and like i said this game is if it's not obvious enough this is my favorite jrpg of all time and it's predominantly for that reason i mentioned before like this links up all eight characters in a way 
but the final shebang that i found very satisfying very intriguing mm. uh, nothing game changing or mind mind blowing but very satisfying and kind of links them up in a neat way and includes characters that you've seen in ways and be like oh oh okay right that's how this links to that and i i really enjoyed that aspect of the game so i do hope you keep badgering away at it and yeah might, i i definitely finish get it to that final boss i don't know no no i, I definitely i it's honestly that's kind of the reason why i'm like i don't know if i'm going to finish metro prime or start metro prime <laughs> this year because i'm like i just would rather just finish octopath traveler 2 like i'm just i'm at a pace with it now where i'm like well everyone's level 50 and i've got seven more chapters at level 45 to go it, it is better at a pace and that is partially to do with the incredibly disjointed stories it's it's yeah you do forget there's so many characters in this game because oh yeah you've obviously got the eight characters but every one of those eight characters often has like eight characters within their right yeah sub characters so yeah eight times eight that's 64 characters uh-huh. yeah, to like be aware of it's kind of wild how many characters at certain points there and are like some um, of them recur at points but it's like okay here's this character from chapter two showing up in chapter four do you remember them yeah. from chapter two when i played it in march versus now you yeah, know then that's um, tricky. and i definitely like went hard on this game from the point it came out i think it yeah. I beat it in like i don't know two months or something crazy yeah, yeah. um but yeah but where should it be on this list oh <laughs> god i don't fucking discuss. know it's <sighs> Yeah, it's, it's I I think it's really good. I think it's um it's definitely a, a step up from the first game. Um, yeah, I know how much you love it. I think it's it's I don't have many arguments against it really. I mean, I would prefer to see Mario Brothers Wonder above it, um, but I don't know. You know, I think we're kind of on opposite sides with that that game. Um, so with Wonder. Yeah, yeah. So we talk about Wonder then. Yeah, sure. Okay, Wonder's great. Like, it's my favorite two D Mario. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just yeah like I, I mean i feel like we've talked about this game quite a lot on the show yeah recently, we have but like people know my opinion but yes yeah, it is still 2d mario but i love what it's reinventing and i just wish it could throw away the 2d mario shackles that i don't i wouldn't say hold this game back but there are aspects that are maybe arguably hold the game back where mm-hmm. i just want this everything to do with wonder and the mix-up of levels i think one listener wrote in earlier suggesting that like the overworlds were very rote in their design and i, I definitely disagree yeah like I, I found them very it's not just a desert it's not just a lava world like mm-hmm. it's it's really weird and unusual and i, I this I, game I think, I think a lot of that is tied to nostalgia with mario world if i'm honest like mario world is fine as an overworld i don't i don't think there's anything special about it i think it's you know it's an overworld i don't think you can make an overworld that interesting in a mario game if i'm honest like it's mainly going from level to level i mean um, an overworld was a big deal 30 years ago and yeah now it's just the way tax i, I do i, I really that. do think yeah. that is nostalgia talking if i'm really honest because like <laughs> oh there's only so much you can do to make an overworld interesting in a mario game it's like okay you're gonna move from level to level i bet um, oh, interesting just in terms of theme i don't think like, yeah totally this path leads to that and that's such a good reveal and right yeah, yeah. but just in terms of theming i thought it was nice to get away from just grassland desert land sea mm-hmm. land you know it's just it, it does feel a lot more different to that it's very fresh like, yeah, yeah. I, I like i was so compelled by the loop of this game where i would play a level i would try and get everything in at first time if i didn't i'd jump straight back into the level again and go and pick everything up i missed but this time playing through the level so much faster because i didn't need to stop and smell the roses because i'd already done that the first time and this time i was hunting for where the thing is and so i, I equip the badge to try and find it or if i'm like oh where is it i'll go online on youtube figure out where it is and then go and grab it and it was just satisfying to tick these off and be like i hit the top of the flagpole i got all the coins and i did everything you know that i need to to make sure that this is done i found the secret exit and now i got the nice tick on it and then i can move on to the next level and and i don't know i do i recommend playing it that way it depends on who you are depends on what you're kind of looking for from the game but for me that was a satisfying way of going through it was this thorough exploration because i I felt like if i didn't do that i wouldn't come back and kind of do it Mm. uh as, as it went i didn't feel satisfied until i had finished a a level completely and then moved on from it um i think it made me better at the game but i felt like my skills kept at a pace because i was always going after the tricky stuff as i got to it right so like that you can the nice thing about the pacing of this game is you can find the secret the special world super early in world one and you can do the world one special world before you do much easier levels in world two or world three and i think that challenge that rigor 
really leveled my skills up so that i could make it through 100 percent everything at a You're good pace it to the platformers anyway don't don't be like oh i needed to make it well i don't know skills. i don't think i don't think i'm very good at 2d mario if i'm honest like 2d okay. mario because Fair its enough. movement its feel is is a little bit different it's a very unique fixed yeah. thing right I've, I've always found it a little bit off like i've never liked the way mario controls in mario 3 i agree i agree but i do think wonder is the one that feels really good like wonder is the one that i think like they did nail it like the feel of mario is the best it has ever felt and i really didn't have a lot of problems with it control wise like i think the momentum is good the sliding isn't as kind of slippery as it used to be in those older games there's a there's a level of nuanced control that i think i have in mario brothers wonder that i just don't have in previous games like some of the new super mario brothers games get there but they also have just that weird stiffness to them as well so i think wonder is a bit more of a fluid but still precise controlling mario um and you know i'm very sensitive to the stuff so uh, that's for me i think it does it does stand mm -hmm, up the test mm -hmm. pretty pretty well um i mean i can see pikmin moving up I think we've talked about Pikmin enough to move it up above Wonder. And yeah. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think there's a there's a. I think we both like Pikmin more than we both like Mario. Um, oh, so, yeah, definitely. So we can move it up. Um, and Octopath is a, it's an interesting one. You know, I kind of like. I like it. I think it's cool. I, there's not really a chance it's going to make my top ten this year. I've too many other things I like more oh, than it. Um, <laughs> but it's a. I don't know. It's it's like a it's kind of like a gobstopper. It's like I'm just I'm I keep sucking on it, and eventually I'll finish it. You know, <laughs> eventually I'll finish it. Will I be satisfied by the end? Maybe I don't know. Will I feel a bit sounds sick because like I've be had too much sugar? I, it sounds like I'll be I'll be like that was good, but it's no sea good. of stars. Yeah. It's no chain echo. Like I think my real fundamental problem with Octopath Traveler as a series is narratively it can never hit the highs of a traditional jrpg because a traditional jrpg tells a story with a group of characters from start to finish who have direct relationships with each other mm -hmm. who grow as a cast who learn things about each other it's why xenoblade works so well for me it's a great yeah. strong cast of characters who grow over the course of a narrative as stakes improve and things get bigger and bigger you know, like Chained Echoes, Final Fantasy VI, more traditional narratives in JRPGs speak to me a lot more. Octopath Traveler 2, it's really solid mechanically, has amazing music, really good combat and crunchy stuff. And the stories are fine. And none of them, they do, they do connect. I get what you're saying. But to me, it's still super tenuous because all it is is, oh, let's have a, a, a little conversation in the middle of a story where it brings up the menu. I think it's possible to do in the same way that i was like i hope they improve the story one to two mm. i think they could improve the story two to three and still keep it eight paths i don't think they can I, think, I don't I think believe this... that the structure is the core reason i, I think do it believe is. it's more to do with the writing i think it is this core reason like i really do think the structure is the thing that holds it back and i that's the thing i don't think it wants to be one of those games which is totally fine it's, it's doing its own thing and i think that it just doesn't speak to me personally like i like the story i think it wants to be a very a narratively impressive game yes. i think a lot of people do think it is a narratively impressive game but yes. like um but it doesn't want to be a traditional jrpg in the sense that you have a group of characters who all talk to each other in the story itself as opposed to they quote unquote do but it it hints at it but it's not at its soul for sure like it's not no exactly because because each each chapter is still focused on that individual character and yeah. them alone i'd be interested in what you think about that point by the end of the game because they do definitely okay. try to go for a lot more yeah because it because it becomes a um you know when you get someone in your party they're like uh, let's just all travel together and do our own individual stories but never comment on them aside from these one little lines that we have in between and then sometimes yeah. they'll do the pairing off and, th and but stuff the, like that their appeal is this game is cool because it's avengers assemble you know like that's that's what's that's cool about it sure yeah but but the reason reason avengers works is that they actually have films dedicated to building up the rapport and relationship between those characters you know like the reason and that's what i think octopath traveler 3 could do that's what i'm trying okay. to argue okay okay yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree i don't think it necessarily it tries to do that a bit in this yeah. game um but there's definitely room where those link up conversations could yeah. be more meaningful and it could genuinely be a lot more avengers the, assemble the, the, the trickiest part of it is because it is non-linear in its approach you can choose who you want to go to first and you can do everything in any order technically um depending on your level right 
Mm -hmm. you i think the struggle there is if you do want to join it up more you have to make it more linear where all those characters have their introductions and they do a couple of chapters and then the next step of the game is everyone does stuff together and it's more linear it has it basically has to break the non-linearity clause that it has with itself in order to achieve that yeah i think i think you could get around that just by having like uh, gates as it were like you have to Mm -hmm. do chapter ones before chapter twos right before chapter threes and i think you could still link it up even if you start as any of the eight but i I agree because in this game you can go chapter one to five with just partitio and Mm -hmm. and duke can beat i think you can actually beat his game before even picking up the next character no uh, you, need, you need a party of four i believe but probably yes yeah this probably thing but anyway i see i see what you're saying yeah yeah so it's i think again it is you're right it is a problem that can be fixed i don't know that they want to fix it because i think what they have made is something different and unique and it vibes very much with you it doesn't vibe very much with me that's totally cool i'm not looking for this type of narrative experience with an rpg i want something more directed something that is a bit more cohesive and that's why i love xenoblade that's why you mm-hmm. know those other games speak to me super strongly and octopath traveler just doesn't um and that's i think it's a preference thing in, in a lot of ways but I, I do think the stories are well told and you know well acted and all that sort of stuff i just you know it'd be nice if they actually you know had a bit more integrated feel to them right even yeah. further than they've gone with this um, and it's just it's a fundamental flaw of the structure of what they've they've done but yeah i, th- I still think it's very good so i would personally you know, love it above mario but we can i'm i'm okay to put it above mario i think i think you know you're you are passionate enough about octopath traveler 2 it's your favorite jrpg of all time i mean mario's only just scraping onto my like top 10 i think that's yeah that's surprising um well it's not surprising actually given your thoughts on it but yeah no i I get that i think um yeah it's definitely it's definitely high up in mine um but i think you probably have stronger passion for octopath than i do for mario so i think that probably equals out probably yeah um yeah so yeah uh do you want to talk about legend of zelda tears of the kingdom (laughs) valley that little little deadly game i'd be Uh right yeah yeah okay so i've played about 45 hours of this game in the a month and a bit so yeah I've really gone, gone hard it. yeah and i've definitely you turned my opinion on one area okay um, and now i'm quite convinced in my reasoning and my argument so i'm really okay. making this argument and this is All a controversial right. argument because I, I actually think a lot of listeners will disagree with me but judging by what they said about mm-hmm. their views on this game um i think repeating the map in Tears of the Kingdom works really well for Tears of the Kingdom. And I think that it's having a fresh map for Breath of the Wild works well for Breath of the Wild. Right. And what I mean by that is we've also, well, we've seen Mark Brown's video about triangles and Breath of the yes. Wild. Yeah. The crucial part of Breath of the Wild and its exploration is triangles representing mountains revealing mm-hmm. other triangles. Yeah. There's only two main ways of gaining verticality in Breath of the Wild. You can either climb or use Rivali's Gale, or you can... And then after that, there's a bunch of other ways. Like You can start a fire and, and glide right, up and yeah, down. Right, yeah, there's physics ways of getting... There's physics up, ways, yeah. but they're definitely a lot more hard to execute than, say, mm-hmm. Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. So my point is that like, when the entire game is based around exploration from climbing and, and getting higher and reaching the summit of a mountain to reveal another mountain that's the joy of that game that's not re- you cannot replicate that with the mechanics of tears of the kingdom no because if, it allows you to cheat your way over all that stuff you're cheating your way over all that stuff so whether it's it's a hot air balloon or a glider with a bit of an engine on it or a million other ways that you can gain verticality in tears of the kingdom where versus breath of the wild there's arguably two two main ones in tears of the kingdom there's 20 30 40 ways of gaining verticality and arguably about 10 main ones not even like two and if you try and swap around this dichotomy so say you had a new map to explore in tears of the kingdom and you had all the tools that you have in tears of the kingdom the whole reveal of these mountains and triangles revealing further mountains by reaching the summit, that entire mechanism is completely 
irrelevant. It's pointless because the 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 journey, the struggle you've had climbing, using Rivali's, Rivali's Gale or whatever you've done to gain verticality into in Breath of the Wild to then see the next in, point of interest is irrelevant in Tears of the Kingdom. So the second that you've introduced the Tears of the Kingdom mechanics, it kind of has to be the same overworld landmass because mm. I would argue it's far too overwhelming, right. let alone less of a surprise because of the, the Toonies. The toonies? Toonies? toonies to, what, what's the word that you used before? Uh, weenies. Weenies. Why am I saying toonies? The Toonie, tiny, tweenie, weenies. The tweenie, weenie. <laughs> You're not getting the same reveals. It's impossible yeah. to. So what do Nintendo do? They create reveals through the depths, mm. through caves, through the sky islands they they move the goalposts on where the interesting reveals are because the means of getting to those reveals are completely turned on their head in tears of the kingdom i strongly believe mm. tears of the kingdom would be a weaker game with a new overworld map it's a, um, yeah it's a really cogent point because you by being able to go anywhere and kind of cheat your way across the world with a brand new world you would never want to engage with those mechanics exactly. because you would want to slowly find stuff yourself as opposed to being like exactly. oh i can just brush over this because i think yeah part of the reason that people are fine hover biking over shit is like oh i've already seen this before yeah i don't need to see yeah. it um, and as interesting as the depths are you do reach a point when you're better with the batteries you're creating flying vehicles mm -hmm. you can fly through the depths and you're seeing things sure you're not getting those same reveals as you did with your first 20 hours of the depths which are some of the most impactful parts of tears of the kingdom oh totally yeah but at the same time you do realize that it's still procedural not procedural that's harsh but like it is replicating the overworld there's there yeah is... like there's there's moments and i think the depths some degree are replicating the breath of the wild experience because it's the exactly. unknown um and there were moments where there's a giant fucking mountain on the above world and so it's a huge divot in the depths right and i need to get up on the other side of that and so i'm climbing for 25 30 minutes just slowly in the dark climbing my way up because i didn't have anything on me to get up there and that does replicate the kind of like the arger the the difficulty of getting somewhere that you need to totally. in the original game yeah um so so you are still getting discovery and unique cool things to uncover in tears of kingdom mm -hmm. it's just very different to the discovering breath of the wild and i think the overall yeah. impact it had on me was I it's do different th like yeah. i don't know that it's lesser I don't know that it's greater. It's just very different. It's different, um, but I will say the first 50 hours of Breath of the Wild where you do not know, you can't see behind those mountains mm -hmm. that we just described. Yeah. It makes those first 50 hours incredibly impactful, especially from an environmental exploration perspective. Right. It's magi magical because everything is new. There's everything a freshness is new. to everything. And yeah tears of the kingdom can't it just can't do that so it has to do something different arguably tears of the kingdom doesn't reach those heights and definitely in terms of discovery yeah i don't think it does but yeah. what tears of the kingdom does way better is hours 50 to 100 become way more fun way more interesting way mm. you've upgraded your battery you've mastered the design of different flying vehicles different ways of exploration different ways of engaging with side quests and towns and going between the depths the sky the surface linking cool like the mazes and stuff like that they're just like much more interesting and three-tiered obviously in tears of the kingdom there's there's stuff to see and do f hours 50 to 100 that are so much more enjoyable than hours 50 to 100 of breath of the wild in my mm. view it's very subjective now yeah, yeah, yeah but i do stand by that you know you cannot just blame the replicated map where i genuinely do see it as a strength of tears of the kingdom now we're not here to just compare these two games no we're here no. to talk about the best game of this year yeah uh -huh. and categorically tears of the kingdom is head and shoulders my game of the year and it should be top of this list yeah i think tears of the kingdom is probably going to fall somewhere in the middle of my list the um, middle yeah i think it's going to be like number but six just above or the something. depths yeah yeah um <laughs> it's I, I think it is phenomenal. 
I think it really is. I think it is a phenomenal game. It's a remarkable achievement of technology. But there's, you know, sometimes when it comes down to video games, it's about emotion, right? It's about what moved you, what stirred you, right? That's why Space for the Unbound and Vemba, I think, work because they are narratives that are stirring emotionally. It's why Xenoblade works for me because it's a nostalgic connection that brings things together, that puts it on top. It's why Cocoon is like, works for me because it's it's it hooked me from a, like, what is this ethereal weird world? How am I figuring this stuff out? It's pure magic. And Tears of the Kingdom has some of those highest highs of pure magic. The Master Sword, getting the Master Sword, the entire way that you do that, how you approach it, what your story was to get it, different for everybody in a, in a, in a lot of ways, very similar in a lot of ways, but what a breathtaking moment of a game that will stay with me for a very long time. Um, the ending of the game, like all the sequences, there are so many spectacles and set piece moments um that are amazing i like dungeons bosses i think were pretty strong quests yeah up I, to those yeah all that stuff is 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 really like memorable it's just i think the in-between moments that for me didn't i just don't remember them anymore and that's so remarkable given breath of the wild i can tell you i can tell you that very first journey i took moment by moment still emblazoned in my brain and the again i think this is what you're coming back to is because it's the same world th those moments don't stick out as much to me um and like i i did love it a lot i thought it was really really great and like you know hearing people talk about it again at the end of the year and i'm like oh yeah that thing and that thing oh that was so good and there was these amazing things that happened and i, I really loved um I think it's Hateno Village with the mayor election. I don't know if you did all that stuff. That was yeah. I didn't get around to it, but I do have that oh side God. quest in my list. Such a good side quest, the best side quest in the game. Um, so so best good. Best one in the game. Wow. Yeah, for me at least, that was the most memorable. There's there's some some cool things you have to figure out to do that. But I I I played a bit more Tears of the Kingdom on the plane, and I I was trying to do stuff. I was like, oh, I just want to make something, and I tried and was okay and it didn't really go anywhere and i was chopping down trees and i was like oh but i don't have enough resources on me i have to go grind those okay so i have to go down with the depths and just hit a bunch of rocks to get resources so i can use zonite so i can then go and up to the surface and put orbs there's a grindiness to tears of the kingdom there's a real grindiness to be like i need this and i need this and i need this if i want to have fun making vehicles i need all these objects and i have to go you have to put in the work like you, it's you have to put like in the work the reward they're giving you for you need to explore land you know sky land and yeah. depths because you need resources from all three at different mm -hmm. points in the game like yeah. they really push you like and case exactly. like you you need to go to all three and you're right it's possible to run out of one resource right and then you're like, right, well, I have to now go and do mm -hmm. X to complete Y, for sure. And, and the problem is, is that the once you realize what is happening, the facade completely disappears. The depths is all the fucking same. There's nothing... Once you found one of the interesting bosses and you realize the Koga story is down there and there's like a couple more things, it's just empty nothingness with enemies. There's nothing interesting there. The mm, sky... You got bases with designs and things. The, yeah, there's... Yeah, cool. Okay, they're just like, the enemy encampments. Like, there's they are a enemy of, encampments, but that's the same yeah. as the overworld. Yeah. The land. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's another issue, right? Because that's... There's, there's not... That because there's no freshness to it, it the facade reveals itself far more and it becomes a well i'm gonna go down there and i'm gonna hit some stuff and get some stuff and the sky is the exact same it's becomes the same every cave you go into has bright bloom seeds it has those rabbits and it maybe has some other resource you might find a chest and what's the chest going to be it's going to be a piece of armor probably something that was already in the first game already there's no interesting rewards i think i talked about this on the discord there's a side quest that involves a great plateau and you have to get these things from the top of the plateau to the depths and you move all this stuff and there's this really interesting story going on with it there's like an intrigue to it and it is this task it took me like two and a half three hours to just do this it was really the journey was great Mm, yeah, but the end strong. result was here's a piece of heart here's a fucking heart 
that was for all that that three hour thing that unique bespoke content they're like have a heart i'm like fuck off like that is not how you make this work like the you have to have a payoff i think breath of the wild suffered from this as well but yeah. i think it did but it's obfuscated by the fact that everything was so fresh and brand new and impactful true that you see the facade you see the lines you see the breaking points you see the repetitive nature of tears of the kingdom so much sooner so much earlier because the impact is not there anymore and i think that is the fundamental problem with it is i jump back into it and i'm like eh, well i don't know what to do now it's just i can guess i can fly to another shrine but none, none of you've kind of had all the big yeah. reveals by that point I've, exactly it's yeah go I've, back I've, to and again i i'm very much i'm much lower on this I, I think the shrine design in tears of the kingdom is far weaker than breath of the wild really it's far I less interesting by them as well no i don't i, th I think again oh, you talked about this before but like they go step one and two they never get to step three all of them all of them are so simple easy conquerable understandable and then they never get to step three and that for me just it just lessens the impact it's just not making it as fun anymore again because some of the mechanics that you know it's like oh man that fucking shrine in breath of the wild where i had to carry that ice cube i realized i had a fucking fire rod on my back and that's why it was melting it, that trick doesn't work again because you try and do that a second time with a new shrine in this game it's like oh that mechanic and it, it becomes mundane right the magical becomes mundane and i think that is my fundamental problem with tears of the kingdom is you know it, it's all been done before and there's some stuff on top you didn't feel magic with the new mechanics in shrines no because they never force you to use them in interesting ways like there's really? it's always very obvious what you have to do i find all the shrines very easy and none of them challenged me none of them got my brain working in a way and the very few that do i was like oh that's great that really did work it yeah yeah there's definitely some in there but there are some but like the majority of them i did 108 i checked uh and that is more i think i'm 106 maybe i can't yeah, remember yeah and like about 70 or 80 of those were like i didn't even need my brain on for this like i could do this without thinking um and you know i think that's that's a little bit of a problem in a game that has such interesting tools that they don't get you to engage beyond the basics of it you know um and you can do you can become a wild creative person with it but that is there's no end to that aside from posting on social media about it right like there's no reason to do that and that's the minecraft generation right and that's i think why it's connecting with a lot of younger people is because people who grew up with minecraft grew up with there's no point there's no objective i just want to build a cool thing and that's what tears of the kingdom is it's built for people who want to build a cool thing and if you don't want to build a cool thing it, it doesn't have as the, much the I think. cool things that i built were very useful in the end game for like for sure like getting from a to b in the depths and doing cool shit down there mm. i built vehicles to do that like yeah and that was awesome i was like some of the highs of the game was just like i'm just cruising to this next point like this is amazing i can like i've stuck a, a torch on the front i can see stuff like mm -hmm. this is this is incredible and like this is something i couldn't have done 30 40 hours into the game i needed mm. all those batteries i needed all that zone light to like get to this point like it was very re rewarding and and satisfying yeah i guess it, it depends what you're looking for right because to me that just says oh i just i'm just gonna fly across all this stuff that i'm not going to engage with right you know like you're getting you you reduce it from an interesting place to explore and a, a depth to explore to like i'm going point to point and and there's nothing in between because i don't need to engage with and it. i think that's the best use of the depths that's yeah. the nature of the way they're designed is that mm -hmm. it is mimicking the overworld there's some interesting pl points there there's even a dungeon there there's like yes. cool stuff down there but like you can still benefit from going a to b in a flying contraption like that's right. still like a satisfying thing and you're not necessarily missing a you're not necessarily flying over a ton that you're going to miss you're going to miss some stuff obviously mm -hmm. and like because the nature of discovery in this game is normally vertical and cave related than it is oh i'm over this mountain now i can see x which yeah. is like the whole point of breath of the wild but how did you feel about the game between the fourth dungeon and the end game because I, I thought that was amazing it was absolutely it was awesome. amazing yeah i yeah. think it takes all the skills you've learned so far and forces you to a bit like the the um uh plateau quest you described mm -hmm. 
it forces you to do those for i would argue a better reward than yes a piece of art oh 100 um, percent, yeah for sure. and then links to the end game and all these cool ways and we can talk about the story and maybe a spoiler cast or something yeah, i don't know yeah. but like just using the mechanics in awesome ways and forcing you to do cool things i was mm-hmm. so so i'd heard very high thing high uh, good things about the end game so my expectations were very high and it still i think surpassed those like it was really really incredible and i think maybe that was one part of breath of the wild where i thought the ending was not wrote but it was like okay well yeah th- that's how that ends yeah know. exactly it's 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 expected and you kind of do what was expected this was very surprising yes exactly the the fact that it goes on way longer than you expect it to and you have to do a lot more stuff than you expect and there's a there's a journey aspect to it of like oh take this thing from way in the sky all the way down below for this one purpose and the whole construction aspect to it like it's a and then there's the surprise at the end of like oh i can do this now oh what the fuck oh yeah. okay. like it's a brand new set of mechanics that like introduce an hour 100 that's like what the fuck game you know like yeah. it's insane um and yes i think all that stuff is tremendous like i said this game has some of the highest highs in any game i've ever played it's just that it's pockmarked with really kind Where of like pod pockmarked <laughs> Yeah, it is, yeah. It's just like, it's good. Whoa, way up high. Look at this fucking thing. That story reveal, holy shit. And then you're like, okay. And then it's mm, doing the regular stuff again. Oh my God, the story reveal, this this dungeon, this moment. And then you're like, oh, okay, back to the game. And yeah, I think I think the back to the game part was like, okay, I can count on one hand of like, okay, what's the new stuff? Um, getting the Koroks places, Addison signs, running out of other things that are in the overworld that are new right that, that's it i can point to two things addison signs and the korok puzzles what else is new in the overworld that's a unique like all thing? the side quests like, the dungeons the, the side quest where you're like get the big horse again uh the side quest where you get the skull horse again like there are side quests that are just repeated in this game there's armor that is just repeated in this game none of the rewards are interesting because they are things you've 90 percent already seen before in the previous game i think that is a real problem for me and why for me elden ring is like way higher in my mind than tears of the kingdom because even if you find something that you can't use in elden ring it's always a unique thing with its own animation its own skill its own unique identity it's 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 interesting since i made my argument about the design of the world it sounds like you've rolled back a little bit on it's less the shape of the mountains that Mm-hmm. are repeated and more yes. the things in the world that yes are repeated. yes i think that that's the thing i realized is like it is it is i'm just doing the the big you know horse quest again i'm just talking to the same person again and they actually want me to do the exact same fucking quest from breath of the wild and that's quirky in some ways so it's like oh i remember that from last time i'm doing it again but for me it's like you haven't made anything new you're just repeating things you've already done and um and yeah that's what takes away from it because like you go on this magical adventure to this cool area and you find a chest you're like oh what could be in it oh it's the wind waker tunic okay Mm. cool you know like that's that's the reward for every cool area don't diss the wind waker tunic that's not the best (laughs) no no of course yeah of course i get it but like it was in the previous game you could get it from an amiibo all that sort of stuff like it's just i just wish that you opened a chest and you were like wowed by what was in the chest and i'm never ever in this entire game wowed yeah it was rare to be wowed by what was in the chest i agree yeah. I, yeah. I i do think one of my favorite shrine quests was a really simple one actually it wasn't that simple it was like a puzzle and it was like so it's in and around mount Lanayru, and you have to start in the sky and it asks you to like jump off this sky platform onto the land and then and then snowboard shield surf down mm. through these like checkpoints in order to reach the shrine and it's like it hints at what you might need to do it doesn't say you need to go it was like just this really satisfying hmm i think i need to start at that point and then it's like follow the thing and it, i just loved like there weren't enough things like that where it's like yes. whoa, this is like a really unique way of unlocking the shrine i miss um what's his face the fucking accordion bird cast that was a very cast styled exactly like there are no cast there is not enough cast style shrine puzzles where you the the puzzle is like when you go in the shrine you get the reward straight away because the the shrine was doing the thing outside the shrine yeah you know that was those were some of my favorite things in the original game that was definitely an element that was stronger than this game for sure yeah absolutely and you know again i just remembered another one i remember the moment in breath of wild where it was a puzzle where it's like go up and look at the 
the jaws of the something, right? And you look and it's like, oh, fucking, it's the shape of a bird in the world. And you're like, oh my god, I go there and I go inside and that's where the thing is. They do the exact same thing. I thought they did a lot of cool stuff like that with the main story, actually. I like uh, Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the water, oh my god, the water droplet one definitely oh. th- made me, I was like 40 minutes trying to figure that out. And I was like, oh, I'm an <laughs> idiot. Like I'm so, oh my so... god, I'm, I felt so stupid uh, at the end of that. I was like, But I'm then they do like, idiot. there's one later where it's like the tall heads of the dragons. You're like, mm, oh shit, okay, yes. it's along this river. And then the tail least, okay, right. And you look at your yes. map and yeah, yeah. that's the kind of like. Exactly, like, and I wish there was more. It, again, it's cast themed puzzling yeah. you know yeah, exactly use environmental puzzle solving my favorite yeah. thing in the world environment and there's just not a lot of that because it's mostly going to the shrine do the thing um but yeah like the same Often, they, yeah. they pull the same trick like it, this is what i'm talking about it's not the exact same thing but in the rito village they pull the exact same trick which is oh when the shadow of the thing and you look up and it's like a time of day and you see a shadow and the shadow is of like a bird pointing to a cave and it's like that's cool but it, it just doesn't impact me in the same way because I already did it the first time and the first time was mind-blowing. The second time is mundane, right? And I think that's that's the that's the hill that I, I find very hard to get over with Tears of the Kingdom. I, I mm-hmm. think it's tremendous. One of the best games ever made. The fact that it fucking works and doesn't break the Switch. That despite like I, br- I broke, yeah. I tried to break it so hard. Like I... There was I got a video clip of like oh this thing's gonna fuck up now it's gonna break and then it just didn't and I was like what the hell Nintendo this is insane. Um, One of the schematics you can get that's actually part of like the Koga Quest I believe is just a ridiculously long bridge, and it's like yes. wow you, everyone's now everyone's made a ridiculously long bridge uh-huh. yeah and that's obviously linked to that um, the Rito village the Rito right? village I didn't actually do it that way but anyway yeah there's multiple the ways you can do it which is great yeah. right you can do the pine cone trick which you like the pine cones make a much stronger updraft yeah. if you burn them so you can use that but I was like I knew I could do that but I was like I'm actually just going to chop down all these trees to make a stupidly long bridge because that's what yeah. I want to do you know and like but the game is confident to give you that ridiculously long bridge and be like, yeah, it's not going to break. It's all good. Here's the schematic for that long bridge. Mm-hmm. But what if I told you, like, even on the very final boss of the game, I just used a... I had a line... You used a long bridge on the last no, of the I game? No, I mean, I wish. But I used <laughs> a... I had, every time I saw a bunch of rockets, I would stick them all to a bunch of shields. And in the final boss of the game, I used my rocket shield. I had a Lionel bow... And I just went to town with bomb arrows on the Lionel bow, so three at a time, down on the final boss. Uh, and even that alone did like quarter of his whole health, like just going mm. for that. It's just like, this is so satisfying. I've just come up with like a way of not cheat, or well, I guess cheesing the final boss in a way. Like it's it's things like that that are just another level with this game where it's encouraging you to just think outside the box and and yes the signs are just like one new thing but they're a really cool thing because they're encouraging you to like utilize the tools to support the sign to they're just making you more confident with doing that consistently in the world Mm. um and when you have worked on those skills and then you are you are the game then demands you to use those skills in story moments which happens frequently it's like right this is like this game is just another level when it comes to like this weird design thing that's incorporating into everything and i love it um yeah so cool one more point i just want to make on like cool like overworld like the points spot the points do the like the cast style puzzles we can call them like i do think the discovery of everything to do with gerudo was very well done on that whole puzzle in the overworld uh, uh, aspect Oh yes, like the the whole uh, uh, sandstorm kind of yes. thing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Cool. And really again, cool. once again, Gerudo, my favorite section of the game. I thought I had the best dungeon because they have the most new stuff in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They have like, and I think I do think like the bespoke stuff they do. Like part of Gerudo is like a tower defense mission where you're just like really defending cool. the town and you have to place soldiers at different points and like the lightning stuff that you utilize there is really smart. I love how the beginning of that dungeon opens with the boss fight and then you're like oh my god and then you go in and do it and then you close with it again and it's, you you can get up to the boss room by ascending into the boss room and you can't do anything in there until you finish the dungeon yeah, but i, I ascended well. all the way up and i was like oh okay i guess i can't do this yet um but yeah that one felt a bit more traditional in terms of its structure had a bit of arbiter's vi- uh, grounds vibe to it as well sure. the beginning of it um yeah that was that was really strong again like the i think the bespoke spectacle designed stuff in this game is unique enemies for that area 
Yes, yeah, exactly. And like you figure out that those guys drop these bones, the Gibdo bones that are super strong on arrows, but they break really quickly. Mm. Um, and so you don't really want to use them on regular weapons because they'll snap instantly, but they do so much damage. Um, yeah, I, I, I think all that kind of custom designed main story path stuff in this game is just a massive step up from breath of the wild like it's really really every single area like there was no area in this game that felt like rito in the first game where it's like oh do a quick bow and arrow and then it's off to the dungeon (laughs) you know like every (laughs) everything had a big setup to it like all the zora stuff was go to that high island find the thing they almost all had like a two-hour side quest to get to the dungeon entrance which was yeah totally really refreshing really step up Um, Um, and the like design of the dungeons themselves i enjoyed and i think the bosses were really well designed and yeah definitely a lot of step ups yeah like that the rito dungeon you have had so many cool ways of like using the icicle sticks to figure out puzzles and right. just stick stuff together with ultra hand and you know i can't understate how ridiculous ultra hand is is one of the most insane yes. things anyone has put into a game it is just remarkable that it works and like there's a physics to it that it makes sense and you can just create whatever using it it's it's pretty fucking magical um but again, I come back to the point of I wish that I had been forced to use it more clinically. I wished I, I was I was pushed into a corner. Yeah, I almost wish that like there was a tier of shrine that was like here's the here's the real puzzles. Here's where the real puzzles are. Like you have to make a mecha tank to just get through this shrine. Yeah, and here's like, three stages to mm-hmm. it. And yep. yeah, like I really I just. I just, for me, the puzzle solving was too easy. And I think that's the problem from my enjoyment of Zelda. One of my favorite aspects of Zelda is puzzles. And I just was not mentally taxed by any of the puzzles in the shrines in these in this game. Mm. And I think that is, honestly, that's really one of the things that drags it down for me. Is like, none of the puzzles were, were at a higher level. And, and I, I really, you know, I found that frustrating. Because um, mm-hmm. I wanted mm-hmm. to be more engaged than I actually was um, with them. So... So yeah, I don't know. I, I you know again, I, I think it's totally cool as a game of the year winner. I think that's fine. I think there's also an option here where we do a Luigi's Mansion three and we say, hey, we both love Pikmin four pretty yeah. equally, and Pikmin four is, it has that energy. It has TNL en- energy it of does like have TNL energy. We we're, we're coming to the Switch and we're swinging big. We are doing it with <laughs> yes. this IP. Yeah. You know, we are we're, we're taking risk and we're saying, okay, we're gonna go like low to the ground third person perspective camera you you prefer pikmin 4 to tears of the kingdom probably not no it's probably tears of the Kingdom's probably higher on my list but i think that pikmin See, 4 is a better, it's a better pick for us <laughs> on this list i think is, is the weird place i'm at because yeah <sighs> i i think pikmin 4 probably or is it i don't know i think is i haven't really thought about my list beyond the top three i'd, I'd have I my personal list probably has octopath above pikmin well, that's just not going to happen. I know. So. No, that's that's fair. I'm happy so, for Pikmin to be higher on this list, but I, yeah. I think it'd be a bit. I wouldn't. I don't think it's weird. Want Pikmin above Zelda. I don't think it's weird. I think it makes sense. Weird's, a, weird's the wrong word. Um, I think it's a TNL unjustified. Pick. <laughs> I think Pikmin falls a TNL pick. I really do. I really think it has that energy. I think it it can it can swing with the best of them. It's got dog man. It's got cute dog. You, you, there's ice pikmin I, I get I, I i don't deny any of this it just the feels puzzles in pikmin 4 say tears of the kingdom is a better game okay but... here's the here's the fucking thing here's the fucking thing the the shrines let me down in tears of the kingdom the caves in pikmin 4 are better <laughs> puzzles shrines. than the fucking shrines in zelda the thing it hangs really? its hat on yes absolutely the caves in pikmin 4 are way more engaging from a puzzle solving perspective way more interesting far more fun i enjoyed them the caves in Pikmin are better than Shrines in Zelda. <laughs> you heard it here. That's how it goes. Can Zelda not be top just for Ultra Hand alone? I mean, Zelda can be... Look, okay, Zelda can just be top because it is... At the end of the day, I can nitpick it all I like and I can be like... Nim, 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 nim. I put 115 hours into this game in less than a month and it has some of the best moments in all the video games. Were your so, highlights the beginning and the end and the dungeons in between? Are those your no, highlights? I no, I don't know. I think like my highlights were actually that... Uh, that here's actually a problem with both Tears of the King and Breath of the Wild, I think, is that they both suffer from you being too powerful at a point in time they both suffer from you not needing to engage with stuff i needed all that power for the final boss yeah for, yeah for that for that i didn't for need it for breath of the wild 
which is no no but for point, for everything else though right like eventually you eventually you get to a point where you can just beat things by like big bigger stick does more damage right um not if you're facing a not a hinox what's the the three-headed dragon oh the uh yeah the a gliok gliox yeah yeah that's true um i think the the power so uh, interesting what you said before right about the sky and conquering it and being having more batteries and all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. i actually think the more powerful you get the the less enticing those explorable parts of the world become because i had a fucking whale of a time as i told that story on the podcast of getting that fucking balloon into the sky and falling down and failing and failing and failing failure yeah. is fun in these games failure is creates stories it creates moments it creates interest and i think ultimately when you get all those batteries and all that stuff you can't fail anymore and it's not fun anymore and i think that's why the i always i think i'm opposite to you and i think the back half of both breath of the wild and tears of the kingdom are both weaker because you oh, really? don't there's less less i was a lot less... more into the side quests and discoveries mm. of tears of the kingdom than it sounds you were and that's what mm-hmm. strengthened the 50 to 100 hours was like yeah side quest plus power plus but i agree with you right. like, i had that fir- that first maze i got to when i described it on the podcast yeah. when it came out and it was like i've just got enough power plus my glider and i'm just getting that there was a great satisfaction in that but i also don't think that takes away from the satisfaction of building a goddamn great flying vehicle later mm. in the game like that's a yeah. set it's a different type of satisfaction i'm not gonna yeah, say true. it's better or worse but mm-hmm. like um i do see what you're saying yeah but what point in the game was your favorite the ending like that final six five hours or was it no i think it is it is always the beginning for me it's always the scrappy beginning where Mm. you have nothing and you have to just use bullshit to get your way out of situations (laughs) because that's what made breath of the wild fun and essentially once you got enough hearts and could eat enough food you're never in danger in breath of the wild and eventually you know you don't need to roll a boulder down the hill just to kill enemies you don't need to sneak slowly around a camp in order to survive my Mm. favorite actually here's the thing my favorite moment in this entire game was the almost two hours i spent in luralan village with three hearts and like 35 enemies a lot of them silver and blue bokoblins and enemies that i just was not in having any fucking business fighting and i didn't die once and i killed every single one of them and i slowly mm. methodically i had things that i got from the depths i had the fucking uh muddle bud so i just got I, I made a makeshift pole that i climbed up to get height advantage on the ship and the sleeping giant bokoblin there i just pinged him with muddle buds and slowly over the course of 20 minutes he kills all of his friends that was the most fun i had with this game mm. where the new mechanics were coming into play from stuff that i got in the depths and i was playing with them as well as just fucking sneaking around and just being weak but overcoming it despite that weakness Be- on that did you then enjoy those shrines where they take your armor and everything away i did but there's a point some of them are very good and others are a bit weaker i'd say yes but but there's also this another problem with getting more powerful there's a point in the game where you have so many hearts that you just can't fail anymore right and once you have that's the downside of that for sure exactly i wish that they just took away all your hearts as well in those shrines. You have a fixed number of hearts no matter yeah. what part of the game exactly. you're Exactly. Like, part. Yeah. make the challenge Six a bit hearts. more... Yeah. yeah. Make the challenge a bit more customized. But I think that goes against the design, the fundamental design ethos of this game, which is just let people do what they want, right? And I think that's... Um, yeah, sometimes... It doesn't worry me for the future, but Anuma saying, like, this is... Why would you want to go back to design puzzles? I'm like, because they were quite good, actually. Like, all Zelda dungeons are really nice to figure out and, uh, you know, designed and you know all that sort of stuff um so i I hope they don't lose that you know because i would like to see if you had traditional ones if you had a a brand new breath of the wild with let's say new mechanics but not Mm -hmm. mechanics wild to the point of ultra hand where you're building space rockets yeah like if they match the mechanics to the world like i was describing breath of the wild where your only two methods of getting up are revali or climbing Mm -hmm. let's say they come up with some other new mechanic but it, it if they can create new ways of doing the triangles isn't that arguably like the most impactful way of having a, a new experience? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, for, for me, it is, it's the, it's a combination of lots of different factors, right? It's the world, it's the rewards within the world, it's the kind of returning to spaces that feel like they've moved on, but not too much. Um, and I think like there's a, the, the, the lack of freshness from all those aspects 
kind of counteracts the freshness from the mechanics so it's a weird weird thing um i do think that you know they very much indicated they're going to do a brand new setting uh, yeah. next time yeah, they're not yeah. going to do the same world and i think for me that i i can see myself liking the next zelda way more than tears of the kingdom and tears mm-hmm. of the kingdom will always sit as this awkward middle child where they did these way crazy mechanical things but like for me that's not that's not the thing that i really wanted it's the last jedi of zeldas it honestly like yeah <laughs> like in a lot of ways fucking yeah i think so i don't um, maybe people aren't there yet but certainly judging by what listeners have said where it sounds like the majority really do prefer breath of the wild mm-hmm. um tears of the kingdom might go down as one of the more ugly ducklings but is got its strange weird high it's so weird though because it's being it's being so critically praised by everybody um so yeah i wonder i wonder what its reputation yeah. ends up becoming um because yeah for me the simplicity the cohe is the cohesion right the cohesion of breath of the wild is everything points to that one north star which is exploration 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 um mm. and i don't think tears of the kingdom has the same cohesion it has lots of crazy ideas and i don't think that they are cohesive in the same way that breath of the wild is purely cohesive so yeah and that's I, why i disagree um, on that but I, i've said why yeah uh, yeah <laughs> and that's why octopath traveler 2 is our game of the year <laughs> uh yeah i mean look i'm I'm not gonna be mad if tis the kingdom's our game of the year i think it's amazing i think it's it's remarkable P- pikmin 4 um, is fantastic yeah it is yeah 3d mario and 3d zelda when they're done well and i do think tis the kingdom is just fin- a phenomenal game like mm-hmm. they're just a cut above everything else nintendo makes okay and how like, about okay how about this okay here's the thing how oh about God, this? here we go how about we keep zelda number one okay but xenoblade chronicles 3 is number three <laughs> future redeemed number, number three, three. <laughs> um it's a decade-long saga i mean i do like mario wonder getting a little lower than it currently well is. i would i would swap if we're going to do any swap i'd say wonder goes below future redeemed we can probably do that right we could do that now yeah, yeah. let's do that sure. let's do wonder below future redeemed because i I would like Future Redeemed a bit closer to Octopath 2 if we're going to do this this eternal battle of my Xenoblade <laughs> versus your Octopath. It's Is always... this like your favourite JRPG of all time, this DLC? Because it's it's a, it's a summation of the last yeah, it, decade it's I, I don't think the dlc on its own is but it, it what it is is such a culmination of everything this right. is two decades of this man's career he finally fucking did it he finally told an entire story from start to end you know um so when there... octopath 3 dlc culminates with 24 <laughs> characters ah uh-huh, yeah everyone comes together the same yes. spot uh-huh yeah i don't know i mean you know <laughs> I'm 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 being you know whatever about this, but it's it's, it's I'm I'm happy to keep Octopath two at number three and Xenoblade Future Redeemed at number four, but you know just keep it in mind for the future, you know. Um, I think I think I had because um, at the moment we've got Zelda one, mm-hmm. Pikmin four two, Octopath Traveler two at three. Mm-hmm. It's a very bally list. It is a very bally list, yeah. But I think this was always going to happen when the biggest arrow in your quiver was taken out of the equation right before we started with, oh that's um, very true the cocoon public service announcement if, look if if cocoon was here i would be ripping your fucking throat <laughs> out okay it would be nasty there would be blood on the floor nobody would want to see it it would be it would be horrible it would be horrible it'd be more horrible than mario galaxy 2 versus wind waker i don't know i don't think anything will get as horrible as that it was just nasty that was nasty it wasn't uh, that nasty it was really it was pretty bad i was pretty bad it was pretty bad <laughs> uh so <laughs> at least th- at least th- at this point in time we can argue with arguments as opposed to just shouting things you know yeah like, I-, I was just listening uh, to like fire escape and yeah. thinking you know me and Emma's there we've got a really mature vibe compared to these three <laughs> <don't you think? laughs> these fucking <laughs> they really the fight dirt. dirty like yeah yeah totally. um okay in the very bally year the top three are always going to be very bally games i guess i guess so i guess so um, and I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I think you know. I I really like Pikmin Four. Uh, I think Octopath Traveler Two is is a good video game. You know. I, I, I you know. I'm surprised as anybody. It's Horizon Octopath suddenly just turning around. Right. I'm like stunned that you have played yeah. both those games this year and not had an awful time with either. No, of them. no, like they're that. both they're both really enjoyable. That's um, really good. So really good. so yeah, I've I've had a good time. Um, 
Is your revengeance revengeance? Is that that's yeah, is your revengeance gonna be me playing an incredibly long game for game trade <laughs> well i mean bali look everybody literally like every email we get is like hey so when's bali playing persona 5 royal when's that gonna happen is that gonna anytime soon bali it's a clock's ticking clock's ticking um, it's longer than octopath 2 oh yeah but it will not feel like that Pers- dude i played 40 hours of persona 5 in like four days and i didn't even realize it like i just I just okay. basically blinked and I played 40 hours. That's what that fucking series does to people. And it's so interesting that no matter who it is, even if you're not into like anime or any of that stuff, like whoever you are, yes, Persona just fucking holds on to you and doesn't let go. It is one of those types of games. It's a rare experience, I think, in games, um, that series. It's just magical beyond belief. Um, so, yeah, hopefully... Uh, we'll get Bally playing it, but I don't know. He's got to play fucking Witcher 3 first, apparently. An Elden Ring. <laughs> You've God. got to play Metroid Prime. God fucking damn, I hate this podcast. Why did I ever invent Metroid it? Metroid Prime's like 12 hours Why did I, why did I agree longer. to this in the first place? Um, all yeah. right, Bally, I think, I, are we happy with this? Are we, are we locked I'm in? I'm happy. I'm feeling overly victorious. That's my only okay. worry. But no, I definitely cool. don't want to swap Pikmin and Zelda, and I can't see anything else taking the... Okay, how about this? How about a space for the Unbound above Wargroove 2? We can do that. All right, let's do, do that. that. Let's do that. Because I do that. think Wargroove 2 is more Wargroove and you love it a lot. But yeah. I think a space for the That's Unbound was a real... I, re- I I want you to play a space for the Unbound. I think it's a really good game. It's, it's a really emotional punch um, and uh, uh, excellently written. Definitely. Wonderful little thing. Yeah. So if You're going to send me a message on WhatsApp next year. You'll be like, Bally, Space Within Bounds on Game Pass, play it now and I'll play yeah. it. And I'll have yeah. a great time. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Bally, do you want to count it locked? down? Uh, Are we locking it down? Y- yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think I feel happy with this. I feel happy with this. Okay. Yeah. I feel happy with this as well. All right. This is an incredibly strong year. It's very strong. Yeah. Incredibly strong. This is like yeah. the most Switch I've played since 2017, I think. I played over 360 hours. I got all my hours counted up. So PlayStation was 150. Uh, yeah. Game Pass on PC was 166, and game and Steam was 176 oh, combined, God. which is 300 and something. Holy Switch shit. was 409. So I actually Switch was still my number one played system this year. Uh, You're saying on 700 hours for the year? I, I think 900 over 900. Nine, nine. 901 hours, yeah, God. and that doesn't count me playing emulation stuff on Steam Deck, which probably gets me maybe to 950 probably so Holy i'm just shy of a thousand um god yeah. which and this is like a year where i feel like i played less than i usually do because you so. were tr- too busy globe trotting oh yeah yeah too much too much of that stuff, um so. so yeah i played like 360 hours switch 93 of xbox and game pass right um and th- does that count all of xbox or just game pass games? i think it's all xbox all, all xbox because you had jedi survivor uh, on there, right so and then I played like 35 hours PlayStation and that adds yeah. up to 498 hours. That makes um, sense. Like I usually do about double what you do. So that probably makes... <laughs> I probably never realized out. it was double, but so I'm, yeah. I'm doing better than normal then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but yeah. Oh, in these busy lives we lead, I do mm-hmm. think we've both done very well on the playing a lot of video games oh yeah there's loads of stuff and there's still way too many games from this year i haven't played yet like the list just my top three games i want to play as soon as possible next year are sea of stars that's on game pass that's Mm -hmm. happening in january for sure uh dave the dave the diver and dredge those are my my three they all have nautical (laughs) vibes which is very funny yeah yeah a whole lot of fishing involved um there's yeah. a lot of fishing in Sea of Stars, actually. It's a good, fun part of that game. Do you have a, so. do you have a top three that you want to play? Uh, I mean, Baldur's Gate 3 is number one. Yeah, you you'll know? probably play that and be like, Bally, you have to play Baldur's Gate 3. And I'm going to be like, I'm scared. Uh-huh, and it will, go, it will go behind Persona 5 in your queue of never-ending <laughs> games, basically. Because it's, it's, uh, also, it's, it's also 100 queue. hours long, and probably more than that. Um, yeah, yes. that... I, I think so few people have beaten that game. Yeah. Dave the Diver is on there for me, I think. Um, nice. And... Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know, actually. You were keen on There's... Dredge earlier. Yeah, probably a little bit less Should so than you. Should we play Umbrella? Um... Yeah, maybe. I didn't, I didn't hear many people talk about it. I played the demo, and the demo was okay for Umbrella. I'd like... probably play it if it comes to Game Pass. Game Pass yeah. is a bit of a decider on some of these decisions. Yeah, for sure. Um, I also need to play Space for the Unbound, for sure. Yeah, You're, yeah. You very much like that game. It's awesome. Yeah, it's really good. So, yeah, there's a, there's a few things um, that I want to get to, but... um. 
as always, they'll just have to take second fiddle to all the new stuff just keep coming out and ruining my life. Like, as a JRPG fan, next year is just... The start of next year is just absolutely fucking savage. Like, here's Like a Dragon that's going to be 150 hours. Here's Persona 3 that's going to be 150 hours. Oh, and then here's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth at the end oh, of all that. Yeah, yeah. All in the space of the first two months. Um, so, it will be a challenge. But we shall rise to it. I think people at home listening right now i'm probably crying out saying tell us the damn list so yes please bali would you please count down from 10 to 1 our game of the year combined top 10 for 2023 okay number 10 sea of stars number 9 f099 number 8 wargroove 2 number 7 a space for the unbound number 6 venba number 5 super mario brothers wonder number 4 xenoblade chronicles 3 future redeemed number 3 Octopath Traveler 2, number 2, Pikmin 4, and number 1, the game of the year for 2023 is The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. You know, it was one of those things where, like, everybody now just has Tears of the Kingdom. It's either Baldur's Gate or Tears of the Kingdom. I just wanted it to be different. I just wanted it to be number 1, Pikmin 4, you know? Um, but, you know, it's fine. I Sometimes I just like to be diff- different from everybody else and oftentimes we do do that oftentimes we are different but it's not just for the reason of being different i think it's because we do truly believe th- that stuff so. look we could have been different if you were like yeah pikmin 4 is better than tears of the kingdom it is yeah. definitely going to be higher up my list and we could not. have had that discussion <laughs> it's not so but, sorry well there we go then yeah you know i, I would have been up for that discussion but we're not there um so I, I, tears does have to take it it does and i will cry all the way home uh no it's 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 great um there's, there's there's moments i will never forget playing tears of the kingdom so i think it's a worthy for sure winner for sure. Uh, in a lot of senses so that is going to do us bali it's the end of 2023 we're done here it's time to go and eat christmas food and veg out and do nothing and i'm gonna play some sonic mania I don't apparently know about you. play fucking metro metroid prime, prime. For fuck's sake. metroid prime um, stream you heard it here first oh it's my happening. god <laughs> why why do i do this to myself i'll be down south just in bed i'll see that you're you're streaming i'll just uh-huh. come in and start trolling in the chat uh-huh. oh, thanks just playing. tell me the wrong direction to go <laughs> yeah it'll be great um, go to this pitch black room with enemies uh-huh. in it that you have to avoid well thank fucking god it's not metro prime 2 because jesus i don't want to be jumping around <laughs> with pods in the dark world Are you kidding me oh um anyway that is going to do us uh thank you everybody for listening you're forgetting a big thing what am i forgetting about you're forgetting the listener game of the year oh shit you are right you are very <laughs> correct god damn it uh thanks for keeping me in, in line um uh so uh we put out a survey a uh, little thing uh that was hey put in your votes for what are your top five games of the year um and i went through and I did a bunch of maths and I added them all together. Um, and I tried to basically do this thing where, you know, if something gets the same number of points, it's based on which had the more votes, basically. So that was the kind of thing. Right. So if something had equal number of total points, the way this worked is your number one game would get five points. Your number two game would get four, et cetera, et cetera, down to your number five game would get one point. And so depending where you put it on your list, it would all add up into a nice tidy little thing. So, we have 10 games, actually. So, I, I told everyone to do top five. But, the, you know, across the uh, whole thing, we've got a list of 10. So, I'm going to count down the 10 games so the from our list. So, there are 10 submitted total. No, no, no. There's much, okay, there's there's much more, more than that. Okay, there's check. some unique number ones as well that only one person voted for that no one else did. And some of those in there that I'll, I'll get to. But um, our number 10 game of the year was Venba. Venba made it to number 10, which is very cool. Number 9 was Metro Prime Remastered. Excellent. Number 8 was a tie between Sea of Stars and Fire Emblem Engage, both of them at number 8 jointly. At number 6, very slightly ahead, Xenoblade 3 Future Redeemed. I knew you were all winners. I knew it. That is incredible. Uh Uh-huh. No. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, people are smart on the internet (laughs) who listen to us. Um... Number five, Bally, Cocoon. Would you look at that? It's oh, actually yeah. uh, it's actually made it, it which made is very it. cool. Number four, Octopath Traveler 2. And number four, very, very good. Well done, no. Octopath. That is yeah. impressive. And very marginally ahead, one point in it. And number three, it's Pikmin 4. Pikmin made it 4. Very well, very well. 
Uh, number I wonder two, what the top two are. Number two, <laughs> how could you guess? Number two is, of course, Super Mario Brothers Wonder. And number one was The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Now, there here's some go. stats for you. Uh, only three games on this list had number one spots. So Octopath Traveler 2 had someone's number one. Excellent. Xenoblade had someone's number one. And Metro Prime had someone's number one. Oh, Tears of the Kingdom was number one for 12 people <laughs> so God. so it was uh it was very very high up for a lot of people um in terms of unique games there are a few unique games that were number ones that no one else voted for so we had cassette beast someone's number one was cassette beast okay. uh someone had blasphemous 2 uh someone had f099 as their number one wow um someone who i think is a troll the only thing that they wrote was their number one, and it was everybody one two switch. Uh. <laughs> so shout out. <laughs> they didn't have any uh, five through uh, two. It was just number one. It was everybody one two switch. Um, someone wrote in Outer Wilds and was like, "I know it didn't come out this year. Also, I'm not talking about the Switch version. I'm talking about the one on PC. But that was my favorite. It's one of the best games ever made. So uh, Outer Wilds. Okay. Um, and uh, and another, another one was uh, one we heard of uh, in the email section uh, was the Legend of Heroes Trails to Azure. So oh. there you go. Are you um, going to go to Outer Wilds? I don't think I ever can. It will. It's too motion sick inducing for oh, me. Oh, got you, got you. Yeah, I wish I could. There's a lot of games like that that I wish I could play, um, but I will just vomit all over the shop. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a, a solid list. I think you know, similar enough to ours. There's definitely some crossover yeah, there sure. Uh, for sure. Um, and yeah, good representation uh, of our listenership. Very happy that Cocoon's number five in there. Very, yeah, very cool. I'm interested yeah. if our glowing praise. Yeah. helped with that but um, i hope so yeah nice nice that people have played that game because wow other podcasts are not talking about it enough yeah yeah for sure um all righty well before we get on our here ballad you want to tell people what is coming up in terms of the rest of the episodes for the year oh boy so we have i guess we've got two more episodes coming out this year we've got our tradition well, it's kind of fallen into a tradition where we have our personal top 10 game videos these are cross-platform personal list we both edit together a video that goes on mbz's youtube channel respectively and the tnl channel for myself mbz's video and a podcast because we're going to they come out as a podcast as well as a video so it'll appear in your podcast feed it's going to come out on christmas day can mm-hmm. we say yeah. that MBZ? yeah i usually do christmas day for mine yeah and i normally aim for new year's eve hogman as we say in edinburgh here um so that will be six days after MBZ. Um, you can look out for my personal top 10 games of the year plot cross platform. I'll do a podcast as well as a video. Um, mm-hmm. So look out for those. Uh, and yeah, that's all the podcasting we've got. And then come January, I think our first episode of the year might even come out on New Year's Day. Uh, yeah, probably. I think so. So that episode, we're going to be looking back at our predictions from 2023. Oh, boy. Um, and obviously doing predictions looking to the year ahead. It's kind of a big year for Nintendo if rumors are to be true. So definitely want to check that one out and um, we'll get there. But um, if you want to send in a prediction of what yes. you think might happen, we're going to read some of those out. Uh, please email this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. That's this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. We've also got an emails channel in our discord server you can post your predictions over there and we'll we'll read some out absolutely uh, so go ahead and do that uh of course you can now go over to patreon.com slash this nintendo life and uh, support the show in various different ways at various different tiers and probably we'd like to thank some of our supporters uh yes thank you to our ten dollar tier plus patrons they are zach s thomas matthew albert wicked gamer uk alan and turtle and MBZ, <laughs> don't know quite I, what to I, was, say. I don't remember where I was, but I looked at my phone and it says, new $10 tier patron, Ali T, Lord <laughs> AKTZ, which is a name that he took to uh, make fun of me, essentially, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so, so I was he like, also decided uh, to be a lord rather than an emperor. Yeah, he did. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah, Ali T is a new $10 <laughs> tier patron. Um we'll see how long this we lasts. don't know why um, we, we have no idea why he just one day just said his email ali t is now ten dollar patron we're like okay yeah, it must be all the top quality um patron content we are producing absolutely yeah, and yeah, he, of wants, course, yeah. he wants a piece of it um uh-huh, yeah but yeah so ali t thank you for your ten dollar tier support um yeah thank you to all our other patrons and you know all the support you've given the show this year in 2023 it's been huge i have bought a lot of very expensive games and 
that Patreon money is very important to the covering the cost of a lot of video games that we, we talk about on the show, both Nintendo and Nintendo show. So thank you everyone for your support. Absolutely. Uh, you can obviously find us across the internet. You can find me on Twitter at LordNBZ. Where can they find you, Bally? I'm on Twitter at Ballyman91. That's B A L L Y M A N 91. You can find the podcast on Twitter at TNL Podcast as well. Go there for updates about things. Uh, and if episodes are late, such as this one, uh, then you will know that that is happening. Uh, you can obviously go and join our Discord. It's a great place to hang out, meet people introduce yourself all that good stuff and you can send emails via there as well and you can also find us on youtube if you want go to youtube.com slash this nintendo life and you can uh have us on in a separate tab which is what i like to do with lots of podcasts is uh, just have them on my mm. second monitor it's a good way to listen to some stuff so that option is available to you as well uh, and you can find us in various places on the internet um you can find us on spotify or on stitcher you can download us on any podcasting app that you so have or so wish to use um and find out when the next episode comes out because you should subscribe subscribe on there review us rate us if you want to give us a christmas present as always head over to spotify give us a star rating five stars is the only rating by the way there's the other ones don't exist you just press the one that says five stars that's we've been having good goes. growth on spotify so thank yeah. you everyone for for keeping that going and Absolutely. yeah those five star reviews really help yeah and you can also go to uh, apple podcasts and review us on there as well write a little ditty i'll i'll shout someone out if they write a poem about the podcast how about that go write us a poem for christmas uh, on apple Podcasts. that would make us very happy um and that i think is going to do us for 2023 <sighs> it's done mal it's in the books oh, yeah. we finished it we beat 2023 um and uh yeah, we'll see what next year brings. It's definitely um, maybe going to slow down a little bit on Nintendo's side. Hopefully an announcement of a new console next year, which will be an exciting mm. time. Definitely think that that is in the books, but um, yeah, we shall see. I uh, have to start coming up with some predictions, Valley, for next time. Yeah, no, it could be, it could actually be a window to catch up on some games, but I think oh. we say that every year and it just we do. So, um, yeah. But yeah, the, you're right. Nintendo, let's see a new console. But let's have a nice quiet period before that. I think we've got like Peach and Prince of Persia and a couple of other Switch games. But like, there's not a whole lot really. So if they could launch with just like an incredible game. I'm, we'll get to this in predictions, but I'm intrigued to see what happens next year. I'm looking forward to kicking people in the face as Kung Fu Peach. That is my goal Kung next Fu year. Kung Fu Peach. Kung Fu Peach, shout out. Um, so until then, thank you everybody for listening uh, to this uh, this mammoth of uh, episode and uh, we will be back at you in the new year in 2024 and uh, until then thanks so much for listening we'll see you soon bye bye folks interlude used on today's show was Aurora Shell from Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed, which is my SOTI, that song of the year, baby. Copyright Monolith Soft and Nintendo 2023. Had to get rid of hiccups today by doing the whole tap out a beat and drink water at the same time. <laughs> it's a good trick. Not on the plane? No, just earlier today. Um... While I was at Tap home. out a beat and drink water at the same time. It's a it's a it's a hot tip. So the pharmacy guy at the end of our road in Scotland, I I was in there one time and I had hiccups and the the pharmacist was like, hey, here's this trick. Here's how you get rid of hiccups. You drink water and you tap out a beat with one of your hands at the same time. Foolproof. Gets rid of hiccups every time. And I do that every single time and it works every fucking time. Um, <laughs> I've never heard this before. Yeah yeah yeah. I was like seven or eight or something um and <laughs> i've just a long time ago. yeah 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 we just walked to the pharmacy and i had hiccups and he's like this is how you get rid of it drink water and tap a beat at the same time and it just gets rid of hiccups um so there you go